Welcome back, everyone, to Chatting with Nuts. This is episode number 74. Uh, it feels like the number goes up faster each time. And I say that every episode, but it really does feel that way. I can't believe I've done this 74. What's 74 times like two or three? Because that's how many hours I've done on, on this show. Uh, but tonight we're joined by a guest that I'm really excited about because there's there's small circles, big circles in BookTube. And every now and then I stumble upon a channel that isn't in what my algorithm gives me. And this happened with Bookish uh, just a few months ago. And ever since then, I've just been enjoying everything that Brian has put out. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Brian from Bookish to the show. Brian, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you very much for having me, Jimmy. Hey, it's my pleasure. I was really glad when you said yes. I know we've been trying to do this for for a while. Um, you had some really great events happen in your life. So you were kind of off handling those, but I'm glad we I did. made it happen. I did. My granddaughter was born and that's been a, a big, um, well, a big thing we were, we're trying to get up there as often as we can. Uh, you know, I live in the Houston area. My daughter lives in the Austin area. So it's about three and a half, four hours. Uh, but we're, we're going back again. My wife was just up there. I've been really jealous. She was up there for four days without me. So she got all the good grandbaby time and now the baby's not going to love me as much as you love. She loves her. It's all a big problem. I got to get up there. So <laughs> yeah, my, uh, my in-laws, my sister-in-law has uh, two kids and I just said to my wife the other day, I said, you know, they visited them about 10 times last year. I think they visited us. Well, we don't have kids once. I said, I think the kids matter. I think it, it kind of draws the parents over there, but sincerely, Definitely. congratulations. I, I met, this is your first grandkid, right? Yep. First awesome. grandkid. Yeah. So brand new grandfather. And if you're a grandfather, that means you have to start reading Barbara Kingsolver. That's the running joke. Oh, my here. gosh. I, I started listening to Demon Copperhead yesterday. <laughs> Let's go. You, you have read her prior, right? I've only read the Poison, Poisonwood Bible. I've tried to get read some of her other books and they just haven't caught with me. But uh, I I had. I, intentionally not read demon copperhead because it was the book last year you know that that in certain parts of book two was all over uh, everywhere and uh i i have a weird oppositional problem where something's really really popular i'm like oh i don't want to, i'm not gonna read that and but i was able to get it as an audio book uh, from the through the libby app and i drove to my mom's yesterday and then back uh and so that was a good five six hours uh, i've listened to it so uh, it's odd that you say that because I re really did just start listening uh, to Demon Copperhead. <laughs> I predict these things. I I, I yeah, loved. No, really uh, good. I mean, I loved uh, her de her book Demon Copperhead, and just like you, I'd seen it everywhere. But like, I'm not into the I'm not in the like literary fiction mm -hmm. or fiction circles, so I didn't see it as much as everyone else had. I wasn't actually aware that it was as popular as it was, except it was at every bookstore front and center right around Christmas time. And Kindle app just kept showing it to me. And I said, yeah. you know what? I'm annoyed. I'm going to prove that this thing sucks. So I read the sample and I said, eh, it was OK. Then I read it again. I said, OK, you know, th th there is something there, but I, I don't have time to read this thing. And then the day three, I said, I'll just buy it. God, I'll buy it. I got to find out what happens. And, uh, you know, I grew up in uh, in the Appalachian Mountains. So, wow. for, yeah, for me, it was like she really nailed a lot of it. And it spoke to me on a very personal level. Now, the audiobook narrator is someone that's from, I believe, Kansas. And I feel like he's trying to do an Appalachian accent. It, it, it just like it jarred me. But I do think it's a great audiobook because of the way it's written. Yeah. Um, what part of Appalachia are you from? So I was from like the Southwest PA, Northern West Virginia area. Right. Um, spent right. most of my time in Morgantown, West Virginia, right next right. to West Virginia University. Yeah. Uh, but I traveled all over um you know the south uh part of west virginia whenever i was doing pro wrestling and stuff so all those places are near and dear to my heart i had many friends that lived uh a little bit further out in the boonies as we call them and yeah, yeah barbara well, Kingsford did her she did her research for sure she, I, I think she lives in the part of virginia where or near the part of virginia where demon copperhead is set i was just you know uh, despite my resistance to it i was really <laughs> drawn in by the just kind of the uh, Appalachia and uh, or Appalachia, sorry, and um, <laughs> and and the South have have some crossover, uh, I think, culturally speaking, even though the South and, and Appalachia are, are different places. But there's just enough there where I'm like, oh, man, that sounds just like, you know, this thing from uh, where I grew up in East Texas or, you know, so there's a lot in there that I I uh, 
resonates with me in terms of, I guess, just kind of a cultural, uh, at least not kinship, at least, you know, uh, some kind of relationship or, or tie in. So it's been, yeah. I've been enjoying it more than I planned on. <laughs> some of that DNA definitely is in both areas, I think. And yeah. the thing I really liked about her book and books that I end up loving are the ones that feel kind of true in a way. And I do think there's an air of truth to, to Demon Copper as well as Poisonwood Bible. Did you like Poisonwood Bible? I really liked it. I did. Uh, I was at the time I was really into reading things or right at the beginning. I went off on a reading jack where I read about the the Congo, just in a general sense. I won't try to name whatever it's called right now. I read history and political stuff and fiction. And that was one of the books that I read kind of early on. And so it hit exactly, you know, there's enough kind of like the historical events going on enough of, you know, the, the, the story being really great. Uh, that, yeah, I, I really liked it. And I thought I would become a King Solver reader and then it, I just didn't. Uh, so. So did you tried other stuff from her. What what stuff did you try that you kind of bounced off of? Because I went out and bought every one of her books after I read those two. The most recent one I tried to read, I actually have it. Oh, I can't remember the name of it. I swear I wish I could run to my library and get off the shelf. <laughs> she has a, quite a few books, and they're yeah. all strangely titled. Like Demon Copperhead and Poison Wood Bible are easily the best titles. She has yeah. everything else. I don't, I don't oh, know. Well. This one might have to do with a painter. I've never gotten very far in it. I can't remember. I know she has a trilogy um, as well. So she has well, the Bean Trees, Unsheltered, Flight Behavior, the Lacuna. That's it. Lacuna? That's, that's the one. It's not about a painter, though, is it? <laughs> anyway, it's lo the Lacuna I have a copy of. So. It is her sixth novel, and it won uh, something from Virginia. But it looks like it is a poignant story of a man pulled between two nations to invent modern identities. Uh, born in the United States. It might be about a painter. It okay. very well might be. Well, um, whatever makes me not wrong, I'm happy with. So, <laughs> <laughs> has a 3.8 on Goodreads, which means it's probably a certified banger. It's probably a great book because Goodreads yeah. always rates every good book three three stars for some reason. <laughs> um, do you use well, good books make enough people mad? I guess that they give it bad reviews. That means it's saying something, which is usually fun. <laughs> usually, <laughs> do you use Goodreads? Are you on there? I don't. I don't track my reading at all, uh, and. Uh, I, I, I should say I have a Goodreads account and I like one day I went and put like 12 books I'd read. I put on my shelf and then I just never went back to it. So <laughs> I don't, I, it's just not, I'm just not a reading tracker. I uh, feel like that's a rarity for a booktuber. I think a lot of booktubers really like the numbers. I, I just don't care. Uh, <laughs> I see people that they're like right now and the part of, you know, the circle of book tube that I'm in, a lot of people are doing that quarter year crisis tag or whatever. And it's about how many books you read. And they start, I've only read this many books. I'm like, I have no idea. I don't know how many <laughs> books I read last month. Uh, I don't know how many books I've read since the beginning of of uh, April. I do divide my reading out by month. Look, I like to finish what I set out to read by the end of a month mm -hmm. and then start over with the books I plan to read the next month. But I don't keep track. Every year I say I'm not going to pledge to any books and then I end up pledging to books and then I get to about this point in the year and I go, oh, there's no way I'm reading all those books. Like there's just no way because it's part of the journey to be pulled and, and tussled in different. And I do know some people who are very disciplined. I'm not that guy. I'm disciplined everywhere else in my life. I like to be kind of like loose and fun with it. Uh, right. But this year I'm looking at that book. Uh, it named about 12 books one a month. I was like, that's doable. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not happening. There's no way. <laughs> I think it's because I'm, I'm, I think of myself and I am a slow reader. Uh, I'm a, I'm a frequently distracted reader. Like the better the book is, the more likely I am to look away and think about something for a minute and then go back and read the same sentence again and go, Oh yeah, I read that. And so I'm, I'm really slow. So I probably didn't count because I didn't want to, even before, uh, I didn't count because I didn't want to like be embarrassed by how few books I read. Hello, Hannah. I'm responding to the comment there. Hey, Hannah. Good to see you. Uh, Hannah is another channel I found recently. I believe Hannah, actually, I was introduced by Joanna Reed, who I know is also a big fan of your channel. Um, and uh, Hannah's books is also another excellent, excellent oh, channel people should check out. Yeah, I joke about her being uh, my cousin because she's from South Carolina and my ancestry goes back to Appalachia, South Carolina. Uh, but you know, long, long time ago. So <laughs> I mean, chances are you're probably related somehow. I feel like every time I meet somebody, I end up somehow yeah, being related. That's what I figure. That's what I figure. 
Uh, so you, so you don't have a, a super structured TBR. So you, do you just kind of, do you make any goals as far as people you want to try to read? Cause I know you read very diversely. Um, I, I really, for the most part, I make it up as I go, well, well, that's not true. Let me, let me be more honest. Like I participate in a lot of reading events, like the, you know, when they set aside a month and like this month is like, I'm reading two books for trans girl, April this month. And I did that on purpose. So I picked two uh, uh, books by trans authors for this mm-hmm. month. And uh, last month I did like as many of the readathon things I did. I did March the Mammoths and Irish readathon and March Mystery Madness. And there's another one I did. Uh, and uh, so I do kind of participate in that and pick my book sometimes that way. But then there's usually like every third month, it's just whatever I want to read. And, and that's what April for the most part is. Uh, for me, but I have been reading the Women's Prize a lot more than I thought I would. I'm not a huge prize reader, but I've been kind of intrigued by the books in the Women's Prize. Um, and then the Republic of Consciousness Prize is my favorite uh, book prize. Uh, it rewards small presses more than the authors. Um, and so I've read a few books from that, from those lists. But yeah, uh, like the book I most want to read this month <laughs> is Cuddy by Benjamin Myers and it's work of historical fiction. And since I most want to read it, it's probably the one I'm least, least likely to get to. I keep getting other things I think I have to read because it's a library book or something I've got through Libby and I have to get through it. So it keeps getting pushed further to the end of the month, but I'm still hoping to get there. Yeah, I, I know the feeling of kicking the can down the road with Libby. And I'm like, eventually they're just going to tell me, you know what? You're not getting this book. <laughs> <laughs> I was real surprised to get Demon Copperhead as fast as I as fast as I did. I only put in for it like in February, so. Yeah, that one uh, is definitely on hold. I think my library has like 50 copies of it because that's what I tried to do. And right. the line is like, you'll get it to it next century. And I was like, I guess I'll just buy the dang thing. <laughs> um, I will say that's a book that has been very successful for me recommending to people who aren't either readers or they're not like super involved in the community. Uh, mm-hmm. Just, hey, try this out. And most of them are from West Virginia. So I think that's why it works. But uh, right, it's popular for a reason, I think. I, I, because it's good. You know, I'm not, I'm only about halfway through. It's good. Uh, I don't know that it's exactly the kind of book I think of as being a great book, but it, it is a really good, uh, a, a really good book. And uh, I think a lot of people might've been put off when they hear that it is connected to David uh, Copperfield. And yes. you really do not have to have read David Copperfield. I have it to, Right. To read. I promise you, you don't. Uh, and really it's just like, the last two hours of listening on my way back uh, today that I thought, oh, yeah, I know who this is. This character in Demon Copperhead represents from is, you know, a stand in for from David Copperfield. But uh, you don't need to know that at all. It, it, it works either way. So, yeah. Yeah. It actually made me more interested in actually trying on David Copperfield because it's not something that I, was really on my list. Like, I know people like it, but I was just like, eh. It's kind of long. It's a little it older. Is. Maybe I won't get around to it. Uh, but after reading that, I said, well, dang, that was great. Maybe I should try it, but maybe I, that's wrong expectations to put on David Copperfield. I, I think a little bit. Uh, I think a little bit. There's there's a uh, David Copperhead has a lot more like just raw. This is really bad stuff uh, in in unvarnished language. And and David Copperfield is a, a pale comparison in terms of bad things happening to the main character. You're like, OK, that seems like 1867 bad. Sure. But is it you know <laughs> oh i scuffed my shoes. Appalachia bad no <laughs> <laughs> well i think uh you know one of the big draws to to books about that area in general nowadays is looking at things like the opioid crisis and and what it's done to that area which is why i do think the book will probably be around a while i think it'll be something in many decades from now people will look back at is at a time period of like, how did we let this happen type thing? I think we're already there. I think a lot of people are looking back on it now and wondering why people weren't raising the flags. Then you realize they were, they were just the local people that no one wanted, you know, hush, 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 you're crazy. Stop it. Uh, and so I think with that, you know, when people think about that time period and what happened, I think that this book could be a potential candidate to explain it. I, I think, I think so too. And, uh, I was, I, one of the things that I worry about with King Solver because I've seen her make statements and things like that uh, before, um, kind of political statements. And, and it's not that I disagree with the politics at all, but I, I don't like a preachy novel. Uh, mm-hmm. And I didn't find it had, I mean, just maybe the littlest bit of that right about the halfway mark, but it's gone away uh, pretty quickly. And I think that's 
that's that was one of the things I was worried about. And I, I, I haven't seen that at all. I, I honestly think that that, you know, uh, the last 10 hours, of the audiobook notwithstanding, I still have to get to. I, I can see people think of this as, as like, you know, a potential great American novel candidate, because I think it it, it you know, it fulfills all the requirements, I think. So so that. what are some requirements for a great American novel, do you think? I think it has to like represent some fairly specific American issue. Uh, mm -hmm. In this case, uh, you know, poverty, uh, opi opioid crisis, uh, regionalism, um, you know, the evils of capitalism, you know, all kinds of things you can find in other books that people would put on that list. Uh, but it does so, I think, in a in a more modern context. And I think that, uh, you know, if, if the book lasts and if people keep reading it, I think it will it will really uh, I think it will continue to be instructive without being a work of history, but instructive about the time period and, um, you know, the problems that we let we let take place and, you know, the problems we continue to let place. I, I just noticed that one of your commenters mentioned fentanyl. And yeah, we just move from one thing to another. Uh, you know, uh, we get rid of one and then the, the other, the other shows up and somehow or another, we don't, sorry, I'm about to get preached. Even though I say King for it. Go for it. somehow or another, we don't seem to connect this to poverty, that the problem is poverty, that if we want to solve drug problems, we should address poverty. If we want to solve crime, we should address poverty. If we want to solve problems with education, we should address poverty. And until we make a really good, good faith effort to do that, I, we're going to keep having the same the same problems one way or the other, but there'll always be people who are going to do, you know, drugs and, and are going to, you know, get the consequences of that. Uh, but, but it feels like feels peculiarly American that, you know, U S American that we can't seem to see what the real problem is. I think King Solver points to that in, in her book too. Yeah, she, I think she does. And I think as long as that is the case that you will continue to see this book probably remain relevant, but also you'll see many more like it. And I'm sure that this will probably set off a string of even more. There, there's a lot of books about that area and that there are. And those issues for sure. Yeah. Uh, some Okidu says also the landscapes in Appalachia tends to evoke the imagination without a doubt. I mean, right. whenever Absolutely. McCarthy would set a book in Appalachia, you I mean, it was almost fantasy. I, mm -hmm. I really did feel magical at some times, right. even in his darker books like Outer Dark, uh, whenever he's describing the, the scenes or a child of God, whenever he's describing some of those uh, scenes out in the wilderness, you're just like, whoa, this this feels almost alien. And it is beautiful. It, it's very beautiful. Um, and then a lot of those issues are so dark and ugly and it's a weird contrast. Right, right. Uh, Absolutely agree. Yeah. Well, I guess we can get the Cormac McCarthy out, out of the way. So, so you, you were like me, you're a uh, reformed dude, bro. I believe, I believe <laughs> I heard you called yourself a dude, bro at some point. Right. I think that, I think that's fair. Uh, yeah. like an, like an old head dude, bro, like a Hemingway dude, bro before <laughs> McCarthy, before Murakami, before, uh, David Foster Wallace, you know, an OG dude, bro. <laughs> probably be what I would think about myself as yes. But you have opened up quite a bit and in that reassessed, you know, things that you read in the past. And we kind of talked a little bit before we went live about you were reading Cormac McCarthy. But what, what, what's your relationship with reading Cormac McCarthy's work? Because we are talking about great American authors. He's always in that conversation, whether people, you know, shout it down or endorse it. You know, th there's a debate to be had there. But what was your journey of, of arriving to his books and then revisiting them? Um, I read all the all the pretty horses first which, you know, I have a video about, you know, where to start. And that's one place I would suggest starting. Because I think you get a lot of the best McCarthy without with almost none of what I consider to be the worst of McCarthy. I think you get the the brilliant writing, the, you get an idea of the kind of characters he, he creates. You know, if you want to say he has a philosophy that I think underlies all of his work, then you get some of that, but not beaten over the head with it. You get a lot of action. You get a lot of description of, you know, things that, some people may not want to see descriptions of, uh, but I just really think it works. And it's a good story. You know, on, on beyond all that, the plot of that novel is solid and he sticks to it. Uh, so I read that and then I read Blood Meridian, which kind of blew me away in ways that uh, probably then colored my vision of everything else Cormac McCarthy wrote for a while, because I just thought the novel was just so kind of extraordinarily, <laughs> you know, all the things people say about about that. And then I, I think I read the 
I read The Crossing, which I love the first third or first section of The Crossing. It's just great. I don't like the rest of it. Uh, and that's kind of when I started like saying, okay, well, Corbin McCarthy's not infallible. Uh, and then probably uh, Sutri and then um, The Road, um, No Country for Old Men. I'm trying to just think of the order that I went in. So I kind of like skipped around in time. And I really didn't read Outer Dark until just a couple of years ago because uh, I'd kind of finished with my uh, Cormac McCarthy reading phase. And then I read the last two books, which I can talk about if you want me to, but uh, I don't want to make people mad. <laughs> Were you not a fan? No, I think they're both pretty terrible. <laughs> Interesting. So I, uh, I've read everything except for cities on the plane and mm -hmm. his last two. Those are, yep. those are the ones I have to finish up. So I don't have an opinion on them yet. I know it, they're, I've seen people say it's his best work. I've seen people say it's his worst work. I do know the last line of the book because people it was ironic because you know he ended up passing and it was kind oh. of poetic in a way yeah uh, and that that actually moved me when i read the line it, it did um so i'm curious to see how i'll feel about those two but the last one i actually currently read was outer dark okay. uh, which very biblical uh which is yeah. a cormac mccarthy kind of thing it uh, is. wasn't my favorite of his but i did appreciate some of it i feel like he just always wants to hang out or in that book he just kind of wanted to hang out with the people that Faulkner just mentioned existing and, you know, but didn't really like talk about or write about, you know, uh, who are kind of beyond even the the level that Faulkner wanted to include in his, in his work. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, there's some good things in it. I, it wasn't not my favorite uh, McCarthy book. It felt, I don't know. He, it felt uh, a little bit too vague, a little bit too derivative in some ways. Um, a little bit too repetitive. Hmm. Uh, that's one of my problems with McCarthy. I think in general is he, he can be repetitive in the scenes he sets up and the images he creates and the, the way he creates tension feels a little bit repetitive to me sometimes. And I think outer dark, but I've been, an, I, I promise you my opinion on outer dark has been uh, challenged by many a person in comments on my channel. Uh, well, he's, he's got fans. Good, which, I'm sorry. He's got fans that he were definitely very has fans. Yes, <laughs> he definitely does. And, you know, yeah. I certainly would have been one of them. And I, I, I'm fans of I think I usually tell, tell people I'm a big fan of two and a half of his books. <laughs> <laughs> but those two and a half, you really like. Them. Oh, my goodness, I do. The first section of The Crossing, if that you just took that out and made that a novella. Oh, my. That would be. And we just called that a book. I would say three. I had a similar experience with the crossing where uh, I liked the book, but there were, there were parts of it where I said, this is him at his peak, but overall it, it wasn't, I, people had said, Oh, you think blood Meridian's great. Wait, do you read the crossing? And I ended up actually kind of having the same experience that you did. Uh, but I told you before we went live that my favorite is actually Sutri. Right. I, I think Sutri. And you said something I thought was just spot on as you said, there was some truth in that book. Right. Um, because it was, before he had really come into his own and maybe started to get into a, a rhythm uh, right. and such tree is just so different from every other book that he's written. And it, it's, it's maybe his most difficult book to read. I think um, it, 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 it's confusing. I can't tell you that I, I have a, a, a really linear idea of the plot. I, I remember episodes, images, things. And like I, I said, I, I think what I appreciate it is it, it feels like the funniest book. Uh, the one that has the most uh, sense of humor incorporated in it. And, and like I was saying, before he became, you know, at some point Hemingway became aware that he was Ernest Hemingway. And that kind of like ruined everything he wrote after that to a certain extent, even though, you know, the, the great Hemingway still peeked through every once in a while. I have a feeling that at some point that happened to Cormac McCarthy, uh, probably right about the time he got finished with the first section of The Crossing. <laughs> <laughs> You, you you pinpointed it. You figured it out. <laughs> uh, let me, I'll, just, I'll just say the thing I don't like about McCarthy is something I think a lot of people like a lot. I don't mm -hmm. like when he has two characters meet in some situation and one of them gives an incredibly long monologue about some philosophy of life or something that's happened. And it goes on for pages and pages. And the other character just goes, oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, I, I, I don't care. <laughs> I, I don't Sometimes think it's, it's in that Spanish, too. So. What? Sometimes it's in Spanish. Oh yeah, I don't even I I I don't even bother to try to look that up. I, did. I just installed Duolingo. I said I'm going to figure this out so I can understand what happened in the cross. <laughs> <laughs> I just went on. Ah, it can't be that important. Is that important to me in English? 
That's true, uh, just if you know what I mean. <laughs> our uh, good friend Jared says it's uh, Socratic. Am I saying that right? Those yes. are the best parts. Yeah, uh, I just don't. I mean, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying I, I don't agree. <laughs> you can be as right as you want to be, and I just I just don't agree. Well, you even said that's what a lot of people like about it. Yeah, well. it is, and um, it's what I don't like. <laughs> Key says Suchry has great scenes, but it's way too long. Watermelon. So, yeah, yeah, we all remember the watermelon scene. Mm. And if you don't know, you should. You should well, maybe you shouldn't look it up. Actually, <laughs> uh, Hobo Giant, uh, you know, brought up Hemingway. You brought up Hemingway mm -hmm. and how important he was to you. Uh, Hobo Giant says I really disliked Hemingway at first, but then. I realized he outsources the settings and his internal feelings to the reading, only talking in actions. It's the antithesis of other writers. I appreciate it. Huh? I I've think that's, I think that's fair. You know, the, the famous uh, Hemingway writing style is the iceberg thing where he shows you this much, but there's all this, you know, underneath the surface. Uh, I think that, I think that's, I think that's true. I, I, I most often just defend Hemingway as, as a, as a, a really good writer just of writing sentences and creating, I think something unique and at its best, just absolutely beautiful in the way in which he wrote, regardless of, of the story of the rest of it. There's just, uh, you know, um, there's just beautiful writing there uh, from time to time, uh, I think. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, any criticism people make of, of, Hemingway's style or a subject or settings, or even, you know, in this case, your commenter wasn't criticizing, but uh, I, I oftentimes just find the writing to be really uh, incredible. And I think a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, so many other people seem to write that way now is that, yeah, they write that way now. They didn't write that way before he did. Uh, and that's, mm. that was a really modern innovation. And I, I don't know, I'm not going to defend Hemingway because I'll go back to being you know, OG. I did, bro. <laughs> the OG did, bro. Yeah, exactly. If someone wanted to try out Hemingway, where where should they start? Short stories. Okay. He, That's he was a great short story writer. Uh, like if I, I did the thing with McCarthy and how many really great books I think he wrote, and I said two and a half. Uh, with Hemingway, I think three great books. One of them is not The Old Man in the Sea. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then his novels have a tendency to be bad. Uh, I think uh, to have and have not is bad across the river and into the trees is bad. Um, uh, I've never read Torrance of Spring, but he didn't write that seriously anyway. So I never felt like I had to write it, but uh, some great short stories, uh, big two hearted river, just my absolute favorite short story uh, ever, I, I think probably. And I just think it's just note perfect uh, in terms of the writing. So I would start with short stories. I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan of checking out authors that I love and their short stories. I've done this with um, George R. R. Martin. I've done this with like Tolstoy. I started out, like I told you, I started out with Tolstoy actually on short stories. And there's something about having a limited amount of words to work with and maximizing that potential that I, th to me, that's like whenever writing can like really blow my mind Yes, uh, when someone can get something done. It's one of the reasons why Steven Erickson, who writ, wrote uh, Malazan Book of the Fall, and he was a short story writer, mm -hmm. or at least, at least, you know, that's the approach that he had taken. And I think that his skills in that actually went over when he started writing thousand page tomes. And that's why you can read those books two, three, four or five times and get something new out of each one. Cause every sentence has just right. a ton of stuff packed into it. So uh, right. short fiction, something that I would like to actually end up reading um, a little bit more of in the future. Yeah. Uh, if I were going to read a Hemingway novel, I would read. Um, oh, I just left my mind. This is the problem of having a 56 year old on your show. <laughs> the name of the novel just literally went right out of my head. Anyway, it's the second one. <laughs> not the sun also rises, not for whom the bell tolls, which I think is his best novel. But um, what am, oh my goodness, a farewell to arms. Yes. A farewell to arms. That's, okay, that's what I, I think. That's his best writing in a novel. <laughs> not that anybody asked me that question, but. Well, no, it's we'll good to know because there are we'll some people. Anyway, so. There are some people who are a little apprehensive to short story. I don't know why, but there are some people who yeah. feel that they d shouldn't waste their time reading short stories, which I would disagree with. But you know, everyone has. We only got a limited time on Earth, so I get it. Do what you read, want. But. Read what you want. Yes, absolutely. Um, there was somebody here that had a question for. Yeah, it was Evie. She was wondering. She said, "Brian, what are your thoughts on John Steinbeck? Yeah, I feel like Hemingway, Faulkner, and Steinbeck are the holy trinity of classic American literature." With that, re with that reaction, I have a feeling you do not like Steinbeck. I feel like I'm getting set up here. 
Um, I'm not a John Steinbeck fan. Having said that, I haven't read East of Eden, and I'm going to this year. Um, I like Steinbeck in his shorter novels. Um, uh, I thought, um, oh, um, Cannery Row is my favorite John Steinbeck. I think it's funny. I think it's really uh, perfect. I think um, the Tortilla Flats one, I can't remember the first word of that title. I think it's funny. I think it's really well done. Of Mice and Men, uh, really well done. I do not care for... Um, why am I doing this today? Because <laughs> the lights are on. It right? must be it. On. <laughs> oh, what's the big uh, Grapes of Wrath? I do not care for Grapes of Wrath, uh, but I'm hoping, I'm holding out hope for East of Eden will kind of change my opinion of Steinbeck and I'll at least go from, I'm kind of in the Steinbeck's overrated uh, camp and probably that's not fair. I was traumatized by the Red Pony at one point in my life, so... Uh, <laughs> Maybe I got off to a bad start with Steinbeck. <laughs> the one I've been most interested in from Stein, I've not read any Steinbeck, is uh, East of Eden. That, that's the one that, to me, just knowing the premise behind it and the inspirations or whatever, that's the one I think it would probably be the go-to one for me. That that that's what I think, and that's why I'm, I'm kind of I'm reading that in December for Classics and Companies doing a read along, and I'm, I promise to read that in December. Uh, and so I'm I'm hopeful that I will change my mind about Steinbeck. Well, I Teresa says that. that East of Eden is their favorite Steinbeck. Yeah. And I've, I've heard that from many people. Yeah, uh, I have too. That's kind of his magnum opus. So, hey, maybe you'll you'll end up having to buy some Steinbeck merchandise. You know, you'll have the shirt. <laughs> have you a coffee mug? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, K Fox says, Jimmy, I highly recommend checking out some Le Guin short story and novella mm -hmm. collections. I, I absolutely will. I have all of them. Um, Le Guin is one of those people I'm probably just going to read everything she's ever done because I just think she's super important. And I also happen to enjoy her stories quite a bit. Have you read any Le Guin? Uh, I read, uh, was it Left Hand of Darkness mm -hmm. uh, in college for a sci-fi class I took in college? And then um, what's the one with the turtles? The turtles? Yeah, it's the one where the guy's dreams become reality. Lathe of Heaven. Lathe of Heaven. Sorry, yeah. I, I call that the one with the turtles because my book has <laughs> turtles on the cover. And there are turtles in it. There are, yeah. Which is about the point where I went, okay, it's, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't love it. Oh, no. <laughs> I didn't care for the space turtles. Uh, no, uh, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> so let me ask you this. Do you like Philip K. Dick? Never read anything by Philip okay. K. Dick. Okay. But I have a copy of what is it? Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which is the Blade Runner uh, inspiration, mm -hmm. I believe. I have a copy, and you know, I want to I want to read that. I want to read more Ray Bradbury because I've only read uh, Fahrenheit 451, and I feel like I'm missing out. Uh, I read a lot of Vonnegut. I don't know if you consider that to be science yeah. fiction or not, but I read a lot. I went through a Vonnegut thing again. Part of my OG Duke Bro uh, reading was probably a lot of Vonnegut. Uh, and then got burned out on uh, on that. But uh, yeah, and then uh, the science fiction class I took, I think kind of ruined me for reading, enjoying science fiction. That was a mistake. Really? Uh, having to read a lot of science fiction really close together, four novels and then like a huge collection of short stories and to write, I think they'd write five papers that really, really burned me out on sci science fiction, I think. And I, I just haven't, you know, just never gone back. I, I other than, you know, the book I just uh, laid in heaven, uh, I mentioned. And uh, and then Kindred by Octavia uh, E. Butler. Uh, I guess that's, I never know where the line between speculative fiction and science fiction is. She's sci-fi to me, yeah. Okay. Uh, and I want to read The Parable of the Sower uh, and that series, I believe. Um, I'm doing that this year, I'm hoping, anyway. So, maybe. you know, I, I have a lot of books I want to read. And and or, I liked Lathe of Heaven a lot. Uh, and then there were Space Turtles. <laughs> very the reason why i asked you if you like philip k dick is because that was uh her doing a philip k dick book essentially. oh okay no, taking sorry. a trippy premise and kind of expanding on it as she went making it weirder and weirder uh and then, she was a huge fan of philip k dick okay. and that was kind of her like nod to him so oh, that that's definitely makes thinking. me want to read more read philip k dick so great oh, it's yeah. possible i read a short story or two in that class mm -hmm. a million years ago but my old brain doesn't remember that we had like you know, one of those anthologies of science fiction that was like, you know, four inches thick and we had to read tons of stories. So 
yeah, I, I ended up um, buying one of those old bind ups of like mm-hmm. short story collections. Actually, it, it's a pretty cool looking book. I think it's worth a little bit of money. Even um, I got it on an auction whenever uh, Library Ladder is a good friend of mine. Uh, he was doing an auction uh, for on this auction platform, whatever. Um, but there's a ton of stuff in there I had never even heard of. And some yeah. of it is even by PKD. So I'm hoping to uh, to read more of his and just short fiction in general. Um, I think it's interesting. You got a science fiction class. Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, I went to a small state school. It was 1987. So it was a lot of like uh, classic sci-fi authors, short stories. And then the novels we read were His Master's Voice by Stanislaw Lem. Uh, we read Canical for Leibowitz, which I really liked and I think it was a really good book. Mm-hmm. Uh, we read Left Hand of Darkness and then I think it was Beyond the Blue Event Horizon, which I don't remember anything about. Uh, I was probably pretty burned out by that point. So, yeah, I agree with uh, Hobo Giant. Le Guin is a great writer uh, on a sentence level, I think, just absolutely great. Yeah, she is one of those people who um, I almost enjoy. I, I mean, I enjoy her fiction, but mm-hmm. w- w- hearing her talk or write about uh, the craft of writing and, and definitely the genre of fantasy and sci fi, like. Right. To me, it's really inspiring stuff. I think she has really great advice, too. I think she's really empowering and less restrictive about what you can do. And I think she wanted oh. to kind of blow the doors off. Oh, and, I love and, writing advice. Yeah. <laughs> I love all kinds of writing advice. So uh, I, I consume a lot of that on YouTube. Uh, lots of it. So I can go, no. But lots of it. Goes, wow, that's really good to know. So, yeah. I like reading books on writing because I think it helps me understand what people are trying to do with their books. And then I think whenever I, especially when I was doing more reviews on this channel, I felt like I was getting a better idea of, of mm-hmm. things to, to talk about when it came to the writing, because everyone can talk about a story, right? They can talk about what the beats were, what mm-hmm. they like characters were cool. And that's great. And I love doing that too, but I wanted to take it a little bit further. And I've always been a big fan of how do things work? Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just interesting that we all have the same words available to us. Like everyone can, if they have a dictionary and a thesaurus next to them, but like people can put them together in different ways to evoke different emotions. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's probably why I love reading so much. Uh, right. So I wanted to figure out more about that. And Le Guin's one of the first people I read um, her steering the craft um, right. or steering, whatever it is. I can't remember exactly what it's called now, but I'll, it's have, just, to look, I'll have to look for that. That sounds really, and I, I do respect right. her writing a lot. Uh, I just didn't like the turtles, but um, yeah. <laughs> not a big turtle guy. <laughs> yeah, I, it was the turtles in the space. <laughs> just, they, See, they're integral intergalactic turtles, but they have to wear a spacesuit. That anyway, so there's a certain amount of saying. acid you have to do before you read science fiction. Yeah, that, and anyway, I, that's I, I in the I it, it I really think that I was just going along enjoying it, going okay, this is really cool. And she writes really well, and then turtles. Anyway, so but I <laughs> I uh, I I like writing the same reason I really like reading books about uh, the craft of writing. Um, George Saunders' uh, book, uh, what's it called? It uh, Swim in a Pond in the Rain. I never heard of this. George Saunders, short story writer, wrote Lincoln and the Bardo, won some book awards for it. But he teaches creative writing at Syracuse. And what he did in the book was he took Russian short stories, uh, Tolstoy, uh, Gogol, Dostoevsky, Chekhov, and somebody else who I'm not remembering right now. And he, as a way of teaching writing, he broke down you know, what those writers were doing in those stories. I thought it was just, it was one of the best nonfiction books I read that year um, because it just really, you know, it didn't, it didn't make me a better writer, but it did make me think more about, like you were saying about uh, the craft of writing and how it's done and why things, you know, it's not one of those books like, Oh, this, this symbolizes that. It's not that kind of thing. It's like, (laughs) here's how, here's what he's doing here. Like, you know, here's why he has the story told this way by this character. You're like, oh, okay. You know, it just really made a lot of sense. And I, I read a book of uh, a big collection of Harold Bloom's criticism once, and I, I disagree with him quite a lot. Uh, but that, that disagreement made makes you think. And uh, so I think there's a lot of, a lot of value in those kinds of things. Uh, so. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I, I I love listening to Harold Bloom, but I find myself arguing with him quite a yeah. bit. And and I understand that it takes some hubris on my part because like Harold Bloom is the man. Yeah. But I'm allowed to think whatever I want. So exactly. Um, and somebody thought Harold Bloom had the same hubris at some point. For that's right. And so you know, there's nothing. There's you don't have to agree with people just because they're 
I mean, I, I acknowledge his expertise and his knowledge is far beyond mine. It doesn't mean I agree with him about the books that he likes, doesn't like, or why he likes them. Uh, that's yeah. completely up to me. So for, for me, uh, where I've kind of parted with Harold Bloom was whenever he said that you'd be better off not reading than reading something like Harry Potter or like silly, <laughs> Just, you know, the snobbery. Yes. Is like and off that, the that, yeah, really. And really off putting uh, a lot, mm -hmm. I think with, with him, the, that that's just, it's just such obvious BS that you're better off not reading than reading some. It's, it's, it's a crazy thing to say <laughs> as though, as though entertainment is somehow a lesser goal in reading than, than something else, you know? Um, yeah. it, it really isn't. And, and I defy mo you def I mean, you can find books that have no value. I, I or have almost no value beyond entertainment. But even if that were true, the entertainment is enough. And then entertaining books oftentimes lead you to other books because those writers are referencing That's classic awesome. works, uh, mythology, um, historical events, and that leads you to learning them. How can that not be good? How can that not be a great thing? I just... Yeah, there's something also about a personal connection to a story and a time and place in your life when you read it that it could be... A, it might have saved you from something. It could have got your mind off. Like, there it is impossible to quantify the entirety of like a reading experience. And that's one of the reasons why reviews are so volatile is because one person could have had, you know, this totally amazing experience. Another person thinks it's complete slop. Right. Uh, Harold Bloom just happened to think that he knew better than you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, my kids read the Harry Potter books and we like stood in line at midnight to buy everybody an individual copy. Like I think from, I want to go gobble the fire on. Uh, we went to those events and it was fun. And, you know, they had them. And I, I, I didn't read the first three, two, three books, but I read the, the rest of them. And, you know, I thought they were entertaining. It was fun to read something my kids were reading, to be able to talk to them about it and have them look forward to the books. And, you know, I think that for me, the, the book that, you know, meant the books that meant something to me, then the same way Harry Potter, I think, means something to a, a diff completely different generation of people, were the Lord of the Rings books. I read those books as though there were some kind of religious text. Not that I took it that way, but I literally read the Lord of the Rings and then I would just put down the Fellowship of the King and I would pick up uh, the Fellowship of the Ring again. You know, I would mm -hmm. just, or the Return of the King and pick up the Fellowship of the Ring again and start over. And I would read them like, just never not be reading them uh, probably five, six times through. And for whatever reason, it just, you know, was that thing that I, I identified with that gave me wow. peace. It was joyful. It was relaxing, you know, so that's kind of how I got through my early teens. <laughs> was talking. So one of the things that I find oftentimes, you know, people who are younger than me haven't necessarily read them. And when they read them, I don't think they have the same impact because there is a generational difference in terms of the language and expectations uh, and I think that's fine, but it does hurt my feelings. <laughs> hey, that's it. That's good that you can admit that. I think that's yeah. great. I'm um, always like, oh, no, but you're, you know, no, no, no. It's just, and that's okay. You don't have yeah, to like it. I can let them do it. They can have their opinion. It's tough. Exactly. I mean, I feel the same way about A Song of Ice and Fire. You yeah. know, you told me before we went on air that you'd never read it. And right. I thought about just disconnecting. I thought about <laughs> just shutting my router on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, we all have those things. I think uh, one of the things that you said that like kind of, you know, set off a firework in my brain is that you said it brought you peace. And uh, man, this week I just had like a really rough week uh, mm -hmm. where I was just like, you know, I'm not good at anything. <laughs> you know, I'm like everything that I am, uh, you know, trying to excel in in life. I feel like I'm kind of sucking at and I'm trying to work through all these emotions. Uh, but, you know, the one thing I thought about, I was like, you know what? I can read like that. Yeah. I can read. And that doesn't matter how slow I do it, how fast I do it. There's no there's nothing. There's no pressure there. And yeah. strangely enough, you know, one of the dude bro authors you actually mentioned. Uh, there's something about Mirakami. I, and I, I don't even necessarily love any of his books I've read so far. Yeah. But there is something about him in his writing that gives me like a sense of peace. Uh, maybe it's the way he describes Japan. Maybe it's that because I get really lost in his scenes. Um, but I felt a sense of peace. Uh, I was reading 1Q84. I'm reading it very slowly. I don't even know if I'll keep continuing. And I just kind of picked it up on a whim because my friend Amanda just read it and loved it. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it brought me peace. And I think that that's a really undervalued aspect of reading. Yeah. Uh, I've only read one Murakami Wind Up Bird Chronicles. And what you said about creating the atmosphere and the setting. And I 
I, I enjoyed reading it. Um, it's not, I, I was probably right at the end of my maybe coming anyway, uh, breaking away <laughs> from reading that kind of book, maybe a little bit, but I, you know, I really liked parts of it. I really thought parts of it were interesting. Uh, probably didn't think everything in it worked, but I understand what you're saying because sometimes it really is great to read somebody who can immerse you in uh, the world they create in a way where you just kind of lose whatever it is you're dealing with and whatever your reality is just kind of goes away for a little while. That is incredibly comforting and a, a, a great thing to, to get out of reading. And when it happens to me, I'm always like so so it's such a joyful moment when I, you come out of it and you're a little sad. You're like, wow, that was great. I had just had a great mm -hmm. reading experience, uh, whatever it was. And that that still does happen to me from time to time. So, yeah, that is one thing that, that has been pretty consistent in reading. I might have large swaths where I'm reading and just talking and moving on and doing mm -hmm. whatever. But then, you know, a, a couple times a year, I get that little bit of a magical feeling uh, specifically about Mirakami. The one thing that I love and I think it gives me some hope. And I'm a pretty nihilistic guy. But one thing that kind of gives me a little bit of hope is a lot of his books, the, the, the plot or the interesting part of the book kicks off from like a phone call or a knock at the door. Yeah. yeah. And it makes you think maybe life will get more interesting. <laughs> maybe the monotony of everyday life. Maybe when I go to do my taxes that I'm guessing if they're correct, maybe <laughs> I will, something magical will happen. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. I, like I said, I've only read one, but that definitely the phone rings a lot in that book. The so. phone <laughs> rings a lot. And and here's the thing. They always pick it up. Yeah. The character always answers the call. And I said, you know, maybe I just need to answer the call. I, I Maybe, that's maybe we it. should all just put our smartphones away so we don't know who's calling when you have to answer. Yeah. Well, I already know. It's it's something about my car warranty being extended from a spam caller. <laughs> that's that's actually what it always is. I was riding my mom in the car. The, yeah. The breakfast and her phone rang. And she said, oh, it's from Anderson, Texas. And then she answered. I'm like, Mom, why are you answering the phone? You don't know anybody in that place. <laughs> Just don't answer. It's okay. That's why it tells you who's calling. So you cannot answer. <laughs> well, they might need something. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, the, nothing makes me angrier than all the, all the people who figured out ways to scam old people out of their money. I mean. Oh, it's crazy. Goodness gracious. Yeah. There's not a low enough place in hell. Yeah, nothing makes me more uh, angry, honestly, than people being taken advantage of it. Yeah. It's like literally my least favorite thing. And and for all you writers out there who are writing, that's a really good way to make somebody a horrible antagonist, like a good horrible antagonist. Yeah, uh, they don't always have to abuse people; they can just scam them, and yeah. it will enrage your reader if they have oh. any semblance of like morality left. So, yeah. yeah, 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 the scammers are rough. I mean. One of the things I, I, I like about you is that you, like I said, you have a lot of diverse reading and you mentioned Lord of the Rings. So I'm going to bring this up. You, you started as a reader in fantasy. You, you were at one time a fantasy reader. Yeah. So, absolutely. So was it all Tolkien or, or what else were you reading? No, uh, I probably, since I read Lord of the Rings so many times in a row, it limited what else I read, but, uh, I read the, the first Belgariad, uh, David Eddings, who I know is like problematic now, but the books were were great fun when I was a kid. I read the first two, Terry Brooks, uh, sort of Shannara and Elstone to Shannara. And I read and really liked uh, Stephen Donaldson's uh, The Thomas Covenant first and wow. second trilogy I read. And then I read the two books, the two humongous books in whatever uh, that dis that thing about the mirror and the parallel world was uh, I read those two books uh, and those were probably the last fantasy books I read uh, until I read um, uh, what was the book we were just talking about? Black uh, Leopard, Red Wolf. Oh, no, no. Before that, I read um, the Robin Hobb story. Uh, novel. Assassin's Apprentice. Yeah, yeah, you go. Before I read that. So I really went. It was, maybe it was Donaldson's fault that I stopped reading <laughs> fantasy. I, I don't know. Uh, I went to college. Well, like I have to say, I went to college, and I, I, one of my best friends in college was a reader, which is unusual because the college I went to is far more famous for drinking than for uh, <laughs> anybody reading. <laughs> but and the the dorm I lived in was called the Zoo because it was the boys' freshman dorm, and it was uh, it it lived up to its reputation. But he was a reader, and he he was like a Hemingway dude, bro. And that's where I started reading Hemingway. Once that happened, then I had all those books to read, all the Hemingway, all the Faulkner, all the Fitzgerald, you know, and then uh, other uh, uh, American dude bro type writers. And so I think that's why I stopped. 
Uh, but yes, I did read Black Leopard, Red Wolf. Yes, which I, I think is a very interesting book that two out of 10 people will finish and only one of them will like it. Um, and that's fair. It is, it is something else. Um, but for fantasy, so for you, it was about like kind of finding another horizon and kind of going off like almost like a natural graduation for you. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I don't want to use the word graduation because I think it makes it seem like one thing is better than the other. Yeah. I know I that's gonna... not what you meant, but, um, but it just like, I just, I didn't have any reading influences when I was a kid because nobody else I knew read uh, fantasy. I grew up in a small East Texas city where you didn't tell people you read books because uh, you get beat up on the playground. Uh, but uh, <laughs> with, you know, went to college, I met somebody who read and, you know, it's like, holy crap, somebody else reads um, mm. and it's OK. And, you know, uh, and so I, I automatically like, hey, look, what are you reading? And I started reading what he read. Mm. Uh, and then for a long time, he was kind of. Uh, the person whose uh, reading taste I followed. And then we disagreed about Toni Morrison and uh, we still stayed friends, but we just, my reading went off in completely different directions than, than his did after that. But I think that's probably what happened more than, I don't remember ever thinking, Oh, you know, this is not, this is beneath me or this is silly. I don't remember thinking that, but uh, I did just move away uh, to something else. But Black Leopard Red Wolf is such an awe inspiring attempt to do something <laughs> different. I know it just holy cats. Is it hard to read though? It is. It is hard to read for various reasons. Yep. Uh, I'm about 70 pages away from the ending. Uh, I've been doing a reading vlog with it uh, as so I've been reading Black Leopard Red Wolf and I was also reading The Many Colored Land by Julian May, which is like a forgotten sci fi epic okay. that I spoiler it, loved it. Loved <laughs> it. I thought it was tremendous. Um, it is really hard to put into words Black Leopard Red Wolf because it is for such a specific audience that I don't know how to like figure it out completely. Um, yeah. I know so many people who have DNF black leopard, red wolf, and, and, and it's, it's, it's a lot, like it's a lot of people. It's like 80% of people, but I just found Marlon James's writing style to be so unique and powerful. And I had read a little bit of the brief history of seven killings, which is about mm -hmm. Bob Marley and mm -hmm. Jamaica and craziness, uh, which I'm hoping to get back to, but I just thought that the voice was so interesting. And then him basing it around African, mythos and folklore mm -hmm. and pre-christian and muslim religions in africa made for just a a novel where anything could happen like yep. anything and will happen uh in and, that book and a lot of bad stuff <laughs> a lot of a whole bad lot stuff. of bad but i i thought that his his attempt to kind of and i don't i haven't read a uh, brief history of seven killings or even started it but his the way in which he structured uh sentences and paragraphs so that they had I'm going to use the word rhythm. That's not what I mean, but they have a really distinct reading rhythm and they finish in like, you know, I think he starts off the section by saying, listen, like as though he's telling you a story and it has that kind of almost somebody telling you a story feel to it. And then it just, I, I won't go into it. Just I, one of the most profoundly sad things I've ever read is in black leopard, red wolf, just mm -hmm. profoundly sad. And it's about, you know, <laughs> not real people you know and i mm -hmm. it's just I, I was i was blown away by by that scene and then just by the ambition to do what he was trying to do just definitely appreciated that uh even when i wasn't enjoying the read necessarily i was super invested in figuring out all the world building stuff because he was using a lot of of again folklore from africa so there are vampiric lightning birds in this book mm -hmm. and i thought what a weird combo turns out it's a real bird and that was the myth about the birds in africa way back in the right. day and i was like and my friend ben told me this and it literally blew my mind i was like that's so yeah. Cool. Because how many how many of our books in fantasy genre are based off medieval England? Absolutely. Like, yeah. So many of them. So it's for someone to go, oh, I'm going to do that. But instead, I'm going to replace all that stuff with Africa. And right. Well, like, you know, to Tolkien just basically borrowed things from the Ring of the Nibelung, from Beowulf, from all the texts that he had read, you know, mm -hmm. from the uh, sagas and things like that. And and that became high fantasy, you know, that we associated with that that area of mythology that kind of mythology and that just dominated for so long that, that yeah doing something different just and to have won what i mean marlon james won the booker award i think for a brief history of seven killings or something like that and yeah. just to go from that saying you know what i'm just gonna do this thing nobody else has ever done 
and it's going to take me years and I'm going to write three of them. And I'm just going to do it. I'm like, wow. Just the, the cojones on that, that kind of writing, excuse me. Uh, just really, uh, I was just blown away by, by what he's attempting to do. So yeah, there, there's, there's a, there's a sense of like confidence about it and th that I really appreciated, but yeah. I, I also just found it to be a hell of a story. Did you laugh at all in during the book? Cause I did think it was quite funny at times. I think that, oh, I remember laughing and in, in my memory for, and again, when, when that sad thing happened, I just like, just, I don't cry very often when I read, almost never. And I, I, I was, I welled up I, and it kind of had a ten, it really bought a lot of stuff out. But I know there's the, there's a character who's called like, I don't know, the ogre. Uh, isn't yes. That, yes. The ogre. Yeah, the ogre. Comedy. Yeah, there we go. And there's some comedy with the uh, there's a character like a bull mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Uh, there's funny stuff in there. There certainly is. Yeah. Uh, but I was just anyway, I know I, one of my reading faults is I oftentimes miss comedy uh, when I'm reading. That's one of the things where I, I, I have a tendency, I think, to read too. Um, oh, earnestly sounds is the wrong word, but I, 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 I read as though it's all serious. And so sometimes it takes a bit for comedy to, to like break through and make me realize, oh, this is funny. Okay. As someone who has misunderstood sarcasm many times in my life and look like an asshole after it, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do it literally all the time and it is so embarrassing every time. Yeah. Like someone will joke with me and I'll be like, no, no, you don't understand. Like this is this. And they're like, no, 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 Bob, you were kidding. Relax. Yeah. I'm like, my bad. Um, I'm okay with sarcasm, but like black humor, you know, dark humor, dark humor. Yeah. Oftentimes I'm like, oh, that's terrible. I can be like, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's very grim humor. Yeah. Uh, gallows humor, I think is what a yeah. lot of people refer to it as in black leopard red. Wolf. I, so, I, think, I think that one of the things that people tell me about that I miss McCarthy is the humor. I think that's fair. I think, you know, oftentimes I'll probably do miss him. I do think he's pretty fun. funny at times. Yeah. Like I think especially uh, the brothers in one of the uh, border trilogy books. I can't remember which one might have been all the pretty horses. There was some good comedy between the brothers. Just a couple lines that I. Yeah. You know, well, I think the 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 non. Oh, what is his name? Um, I think. That the, yeah. Uh, anyway, I think the character who's in the crossing, who then is in cities of the plane with the guy from all the pretty horses. I think he's funny. I see that humor because that's the kind of humor that uh, I'm used to, kind of a dry, you know, male kind of Southern humor. It was pretty common. Uh, in yeah. My family, so, yeah. Uh, but a lot of times it just goes right by me. It's like, one of my big failings. <laughs> lately, I've been finding books that I've actually, like, I feel like I've been getting a little bit more out of the humor in books lately, and I don't know what that is. But uh, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, having it really saves it. If in some ways for me, because like you said, how sad it, it, yeah. it is. I mean, it is a very treacherous world. There's a lot of violence against children, yeah. uh, which is extraordinarily difficult to read. Yeah. Um, but I, I did, I do think it's, it's a hell of a book and yeah. it's going to be one of those ones I'm going to talk about like this in my vlog and my wrap up. And then yeah. people are going to read it and be like, I'm never trusting Jimmy yeah. ever again. <laughs> I'm never going to read another book yeah. like this. Same thing. I, I when I read it, I, I I believe I recommended it, you know, with some reservations, just because I thought it was such an extraordinary attempt that even when it didn't work, it was worth reading. And I've had people go, oh, "That that was terrible. Why did, you, why did you tell me to read that?" Like, okay. Then you then you're like, uh, "I'm sorry." So I always try to like caveat these things. Yeah. Uh, I do feel. I think it's interesting though, because while the book is very dark, um, there, there's a lot of very violent and sexually charged books in the fantasy genre. I mean, that has been a, a pretty common criticism actually levied at, at the genre, right. especially in recent times. And there is a part of me that wonders uh, how much is like the style that it's written in the fact that there are, I think it's predominantly like homosexual relationships happening yes. in the book. Yeah. And if that has any effect on people act, you know, rejecting it more, um, then I'm not even saying out of malice, um, yeah, just, I, just not I think, being used to it. I think it, I think for a lot of people, it adds to the, to the discomfort uh, yeah. that the, that the other material in the book produces. Now, like I said, I haven't read a lot of uh, fantasy uh, other than black leopard, red wolf, which is that way mm -hmm. uh, in terms of violence and all the other things and a lot of uh, sex. And then the other was Robin Hobb, which has almost none of that. You know, the thing that about, about uh, assassins, 
Apprentice. Apprentice, thank you. I keep wanting to say Creed, which I know is a video game. Uh, <laughs> the theme about Assassin's Apprentice that that worked for me was it reminded me of the stories I read, you know, the fantasy books that I read when I was younger, you know, kind mm -hmm. of that, uh, in, at least in its setting and things like that felt like uh, kind of a callback to some of that high fantasy, even though, you know, a lot more intrigue in Assassin's Apprentice than there is in Tolkien or anything else. Probably reminded me a little bit more of David Eddings than, than mm -hmm. anything else. Yeah. And, you know, actually, Assassin's Apprentice and Black Leopard, Red Wolf both have frame narrative, which is also very popular for a lot of the the bigger books in the fantasy yeah. genre. And that is something I do love. Uh, okay. And again, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, it took me like three times reading the opening to realize that he was telling a story to someone. I yeah. didn't even realize it, you know, because yeah. it's so stylized. You're trying to get your feet down. You're like, where right. am I? What's happening? Yeah. Um, you know, every so often after I end a part in that book, I would go back and read the opening paragraph or two. Mm -hmm. And it, it would increase my enjoyment of it each time. And it makes me feel like a reread of this book at some point in my future yeah. would be incredible. Well, I think I need to read the second one first. And I, I haven't been able to steal myself to, <laughs> to pick it up yet. So. I have heard it's a lot less that way. And I've also heard it's less dense. I've heard it's okay. a little bit more readable um, right. for, for right. lack well, of a better word. So. I probably should give it a shot since I, I do talk about the other one uh, positively. Well, we should we should uh, schedule time to read it together. That'd be yeah, fun. maybe so. Yeah, yeah, that'd Absolutely. be a good time, man. Uh, Philip Chase is here. He said, "Did someone say Beowulf?" Uh, Philip <laughs> is our our Beowulf expert here. Um, awesome. Uh, Siva Reb wants to know what's the best McCarthy book to start with. I actually think All the Pretty Horses is a great place to start. And Would you agree? Yes, I do. And then uh, No Country for Old Men is probably the easiest. I think the easiest access point. Yes, because it, it is it is kind of like a movie, almost like a novelization of a movie uh, in that. Uh, and you get all the McCarthy stuff, I think, still. You just get it without kind of stripped down as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, I would also say The Road is, is a good place to start. Not not on my list of favorite McCarthy books, but I, I think The Road is, if you don't mind, you know, horrible, awful things happening. <laughs> There's a little bit of hope in there. There's a little bit. There is. Yeah, there is. And and uh, I... I uh, a kind of a call back to Hemingway right at the, at the very end, I thought uh, also. So um, yeah, there's a scene that is very, da it, it's depressing in that book uh, that has stuck with me forever. It's still one of the most vivid scenes in my head. I, I can think of um, that involves like the mother, the father and the oh. boy. And it's just, oh, yeah. I was yeah. going to go, is it the basement or the cookout? No, it's uh, the decision of whether oh, you yeah, want to keep doing. Is, yeah. Yeah. Ugh. And yeah, uh, yeah for him to tackle that uh you know with something else and it, it did it resonated with me quite yeah. a bit um evie said the second book she's talking about the marlon james okay. fantasy trilogy she said allegedly is telling the same events from book one but from different perspectives so that is how it's pitched but my friend ben who has been reading it loves it he said that that is underselling the book and there are a ton of other things in it and it's just following a character that happens to cross our paths with our unreliable narrator from book one and we find out some things aren't true that he's told us yeah. which is interesting but that there's makes a, it way more intriguing to me agreed because i'm not I thought the exact same thing he's telling the same story again i read it you know but, but if uh, you think about it it makes sense because the character that is featured in book two isn't there for the whole story they're right. there for a very specific part so apparently there's a ton of other stuff okay. so well, that's good now i want to read it more uh kind of talk it up i'm hyping you up. It up and i've, I've been talking about like oh yeah i should read that <laughs> I am I am absolutely trying uh, my best uh, to get you to read more fantasy. That's my job here tonight. Oh, hey, well then, what? What you know, knowing what you know about me and fantasy reading, and that I enjoyed uh, Assassin's Apprentice, but never read any of the others. Uh, you know, where would you suggest that I I start? Uh, obviously, Song of Ice and Fire. I got that. One. Yep. Yep. No, you got it. That's it. That's the only that's, one. That's the place to start. Yeah, man. I'm right. telling you, especially because I know that you, you, you like mystery thrillers. I, I think that book one, when you complete book one, when you complete a game of Thrones and you th think about all the influences that are on it from a genre perspective, it's very interesting. And I think right. that someone has, as well read as yourself will really find that to be um, interesting. I, okay. I, I think, I think you'll get a lot out of it. Uh, right. Also, then I could talk to you about it, which I love. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do you know any of the events of the show or anything like that? Um, let's see. There you don't are... have to say them out loud because some other people might not know them. I'm just saying they're competing houses in whatever 
world in which it's set and they're dragons and there's a lot of intrigue and oh. backstabbing and murder and my brother we yeah. gotta get you on these <laughs> if you don't know the things that happen all oh, watching someone go through it for the first time is is an experience for me. all right no, all gosh. right well i'm gonna put that i'm gonna put that in my stack for may Hey, I'll See tell you what, goes. you give me a book to read and it can be long because I know I'm throwing <laughs> an 800 page chunker on you. I'll have you to can, think. Yeah, you can give me some as long as it's not old man in the sea. Don't, don't read that. <laughs> don't read I, that. I, it just killed. No wonder people don't like Hemingway. Everybody had to read that damn book in high school. My goodness, don't read that. <laughs> it's not that there aren't great things in it. There are, but it, it, it's so. It's just so boring. <laughs> Uh, Derry will kill me if I don't ask you more about your uh, experience with Assassin's Apprentice. She wants to hear more. <laughs> She's a huge Robin Hop fan. It just it just didn't wow me. It just didn't. You know, I'm not I'm not trying to I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. It's just it just didn't blow me away and make me want to pick up the next one. And, and there were there were times where I thought does he really have to walk all the way from point A to point B, you know, in that really long, he and whoever it is are going along the coast and bad thing. I'm like, can't we just get there? I've always said, because I, I like love Robin Hobb and I love all these big fantasy chunkers. Yeah. You know, I love boring books. They're, they're my yeah. go-to, you know, they're, they're my favorites. I'll be honest, isn't there, I don't want to spoil this for anybody. Early on, there's a dog killing, I believe. Yeah, and, and I do. I tell you, you want to like make me not want to finish your book? Kill a dog. I'm just, <laughs> just somebody just kills, and it's just such an unjust and oh, and he kills the dog just to punish the kid for oh, being who he just no. Yeah, e truly evil, evil works. You know, whatever you are, uh, uh, any kind of animal abuse. I, I, I also actually <laughs> react viscerally whenever an animal is harmed in any book, more so like, than a human. I was so mad. Like I read to go completely different direction. I read, uh, I'd read Wuthering Heights a long time ago. Didn't like it. Uh, appreciate it. Didn't like it. And then I was convinced to reread it. And there's a, there is a dog killing in Wuthering Heights. Spoiler. Sorry. There's a dog killing. Nobody ever talks about it. I was not prepared at all. And it's just like two sentences. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Uh, you killed a dog? <laughs> Can I just stop reading right now? Yep. I know everything I need to know about this book. I have, I have a. I mean, it's like the most minor detail in the litany of things that that the you know character who's most famous for the book does wrong. Mm -hmm. But it just it was just it. You you know, marry this person's sister just to like torment her and torture the person. Yeah, fine. I don't care. You know, raise kids to be awful. Okay. Dig up, you know, your lover's dead body so you can hug it. I don't care. You killed the dog. <laughs> Evie is uh, going I'm through. Sorry, right Evie. She said, you don't like withering heights. I'm literally going to cry. Kill the dog. <laughs> um, uh, Zero Zaku one cool name says uh brian what are some mystery series that are good to learn how to write mystery books because you are a big mystery reader i am um so um my wife and i are actually writing kind of a mystery thriller together right now just kind of like a fun project something to do and it's just been a blast uh and uh i would say that the the mysteries that i read i think are probably most instructive are just like pd james like old school english you know, set in the English countryside, classic mystery. She's really heavily influenced by Agatha Christie, but uh, her detective, his name is Adam Dalgleish, just a really interesting character. And I just, she sets up her not, her mysteries really well, uh, not indecipherable. And one of the things that always bothers me about Agatha Christie is sometimes she just doesn't tell you what you need to know, you know, uh, <laughs> and that's not fair. Uh, and I don't ever felt that way with Petey James. Uh, also, I really like um, the uh, Inspector Rebus novels by what's that Scottish author's name? I just always forget things. Uh, I anyway. I'm terrible with names. So. Yeah, those are really good. Um, yeah, though, those are two two of my favorites. I know I'm leaving people out uh, for dialogue. I would read Elmore Leonard. 
Um, mm. uh, and just for simplicity and the ability to create characters and settings and scenes and make things happen in a minimal amount of language, just a, amazing stuff. But he's more like a thriller writer probably than uh, a mystery writer. But I, I don't really, I have a hard time separating those two things uh, in my head. So uh, Brian from Belltube says, don't get me started on Christie. You will never get enough <laughs> info to even fathom. I, I guess know. Who's done it. <laughs> Why is this? A, it's not a mystery. It's like her going, yeah, I, I, you're dumb and I'm smart. And she has I, all the cards and she's not letting <laughs> you see any of them right there. Yeah. I I, I read um, Crooked House, uh, I think, is probably the Agatha Christie that I read that I liked the most. And I think she does give you the information in that one. Mm. I think she does. So, um, But that's a standalone and it doesn't have like, there's no Miss Marple. There's no freaking... Faro in there. There's just like a, a mystery. So that's a pretty good one. Now, who did you mention for dialogue again? Elmore Leonard. Didn't he hate Cormac McCarthy? <laughs> was that him? That was like, I read Blood Marine. It was absolute dog shit. Like he hated it. Oh, I don't know. He, he, he there was a critic oh, named John him. Leonard uh, who would have been active around the same time. And I always thought John Leonard and Elmore Leonard were brothers. Because if you see a picture of the two men, you think those two guys are related and their last name is Leonard. How could they not be? But they weren't. I don't know if Elmore Leonard said that or not. It wouldn't surprise me necessarily because completely different um, approaches to writing. But I think he, he, yeah, he wrote Westerns, right? At some point. He, oh, yeah, he did. He wrote like, uh, what is it? 610, 310 to Yuma, he wrote. And um, Little Big Man, Ombre, yeah. The Buffalo yeah. Soldier. Yeah. I can't. Well, I can't it's just a great, a great horrible western with. Uh, <laughs> oh, who's the character that the actor from the '60s who's in it who plays a Native American and he's not? Oh, geez, it's not Robert Redford. It's the so other you, one. You got me stumped. Anyway, right. so just a horrible, <laughs> awful western based on his book. But yeah, he did write a lot of westerns, so maybe he did did, did say something negative. I forgot about that. Yeah. I would love to be able to pull this up if it's not too hard. Um, it is ruthless he hated <laughs> cormac mccarthy he's like he thought it was complete and utter garbage like he well, just went off they um, definitely different writers but i might be getting him confused with another um writer there there is a chance that that's possible so uh for if someone catches me in the comments later and i was wrong i apologize but it there was another western writer that was big at the time that was like uh, yeah try to cormac mccarthy what is everyone reading this guy for it's crap wasn't larry, wasn't larry mcmurtry I don't think it was Larry McMurtry, but it could have been. It could have been. Some someone will tell me in the comments. Yeah, I'm sure, for sure. Knows. I'm sure. Um, knows. James Elroy. There he, we go. Yeah. I've never read Elroy, but I, I think James Elroy was famously hard to get along with. So I, I yes, and and I don't know. I guess Elroy and Leonard, for some reason, my mind <laughs> uh, went that way. But the key, you were the MVP. Thank you Thank so you. much. Yeah, that's great. Yep. <laughs> one of the first things you see when you google is someone said i can't believe a professional author would be so rude <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh uh, this is i think this is the quote i found it james elroy i tried to read a cormac mccarthy book and thought why does this blank sucker use quotation <laughs> does not use quotation marks <laughs> 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 oh my <laughs> i gotta read i got i've never read james elroy people have tried to get me to for a long time and i've got to read him just because that makes me so happy <laughs> <laughs> hey if you're gonna hate you no know, i like mccarthy so hey, it's, it's not out of hatred i just appreciate anybody who says is willing to say that stuff so i mean that is explicit um <laughs> baron is also cormac mccarthy and jordan he says james elroy books are great so okay um yeah I'm i definitely a real long list of books i got to read here so oh yeah every time i leave the this show i end up having to buy a bunch of books like uh, it's just like 50 dollars on amazon or somewhere yeah close, i gotta get know. the half price and look for elroy yeah. and uh and uh <laughs> the other uh uh, what the spider witch isn't that the next yeah thing? moon witch and the spider king there i think that's what that's it's it. called yeah he has that. great titles great titles but i always confuse them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so uh you had a video and you were kind of talking about reads that you admire what's happening or you can appreciate but you didn't necessarily enjoy you mentioned black leopard red wolf yep. uh you mentioned disgrace actually by jay yeah. Quetzi which yeah. I made as one of my top books of the year last year. I oh, it's a great book. One of it the best a, written books I've ever yeah, read. It, 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 
Kutsi or Kutsi or however the hell it said the guy's name <laughs> is uh, just a great writer. And Disgrace is so good, but I, I, I did not enjoy it. And it's like, it is actually one of those books where I didn't enjoy it because of the subject matter and how well it's done. Yeah. Um, so that, that it just, so when I put that on the list, it had not, I didn't mean it's any shade whatsoever. The book, if you, if you ask me, What's mm-hmm. the greatest uh, book by that guy? I would definitely tell you, Disgrace. That's where you start. Start in there if you want to, because yeah. that book's just great. But it's so great because it's just so. The it was just a really visceral experience for me to read, um, yeah. for all kinds of reasons, and and to and to think about it, put it in the context of what was happening in South Africa uh, when the book is set. He, there's so many things uh, in that that are just. And there's no answer, you know, there's not, there is no answer. That is, and, that is, and there's a lot of dog killing in that book too. <laughs> Actually, am animals play a huge role yeah. in that book for, for various purposes. Yeah. And I still haven't unpacked everything about the ending of that book. No, I, I don't know that there is a, I think it's one of those books that there's not an answer. It is certainly one of the most difficult reads you, you'll ever have. Yeah. It's, it's but, from an extremely, deranged pov yeah not not difficult on a sentence by sentence or understanding what he's saying but just yeah i i can't imagine i i don't think i've ever read anything by that's from the point of view of somebody's unpleasant um yeah. and just and then bad things just anyway sorry but yeah i think that book's great and that to me you know people said oh that don't you think book's great i'm like yes i think that book is great that's my point i want to be able to say i didn't enjoy this but this book is great and you should read it and disgrace is probably the best example of that. You know, I, I think the same thing about Wuthering Heights. I'm not as nearly as passionate about Wuthering Heights. I think it's great. I think it's brilliant. I don't like it. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, that's, those are, to me, those are two different things. I, I will never willingly read it again. Uh, but I think it's just brilliant. I think, you know, if you're looking for the Bronte sister who did the best writing and created the best, I mean, that's it. Wait, I mean, I like Jane Eyre a lot more, but you know, it's yeah. a great book. I just really didn't like it. And they're, you know, dog, the dog issue. <laughs> the dog issue. It comes always back to that, doesn't it? You no, know, I think it's because uh, I was a kid. I saw one of the first movies I saw as a kid was either Old Yeller or Where the Red Fern Grows. And there's like dog problems in both of those. Where the Red Fern Grows oh, but just brutalized me in oh, fifth yeah. grade, man. I was double palms up. You know? Just... <laughs> I know. And that, uh, that was right after I read The Red Pony by Steinbeck. Oh. You're just like, geez, can't we be nice to people's pets? <laughs> yeah, they they get they get you in early. They, yeah. uh... <laughs> I was kind of happy that when my my kids like grew up in the uh, hey, let's not traumatize the kids with reading <laughs> with the <laughs> books we read to them face. <laughs> Reading's a lot in the seventies. Nobody cared. We read the worst <laughs> stuff, just the most imaginable stuff. And uh, my kid read it. What is that? There's some there's some like young adult novel back before that title that term meant anything um about a kid who's like brother sprays in the eyes with like spray paint and blinds him oh my god like, and then the one about the the kid sister who gets like kidnapped in a van and it never gets solved they're like why are they doing this to kids just letting them know life's not fair <laughs> i guess so because that's that's some pretty harsh stuff for an 11 year old <laughs> yeah i mean my god uh, <laughs> yikes uh joanna says disgrace was so layered uncomfortable and oddly hard to put down and then reading with rebecca nicole says disgrace said so much in so few words the sentences weren't hard but packed with so much meaning every bit of that both those things absolutely right and then mitch says i learned that a woman's beauty does not belong to her alone i never knew that. <laughs> you took the wrong lesson mitch <laughs> Mitch is uh, my resident uh, troll. I, I, I love him you. to death. He is hilarious. <laughs> uh, yeah. K Fox says Canticle uh, for Leibowitz is the book I think is really good, but I suffered through it. This is one that I really want to read. I read yeah. the first chapter of it uh, whenever it came in the mail many months ago, and I had a sense that I was like, okay, this one might be a little, yeah, a little tougher to get through, but I like the premise of it. Like, yeah. I think what helped me in that class was that we I'd read Lem uh, before, uh, not Solaris, but I, his master's voice was it. And that book was like, you know, that was my reaction a lot in that. I, I thought it was great, but I was also like, I don't, I know I don't know what's happening uh, here. And then so to get to Canticle for Leibowitz after that, it felt like uh, it, it felt more 
relatable in a weird way, considering it's post, you know, apocalyptic uh, setting uh, and idea. But yeah, I, I liked it when I read it. Yeah, I'm a big fan of post-apocalyptic. There's some religious themes that are kind yep. of played with in there too, which I'm, yep. I know I'm going to really like. Yep. Um, so, so when we're talking about like appreciating books, but not necessarily enjoying them, is there a time or a book that began that for you? Because like I think in, instinctively we start reading to just enjoy and to entertain it. And some people that's all it yep. is and that's fine. But yep. like, like what changed for you? To, to make you say, oh, I can appreciate these things without enjoying them. Uh, I, I think book two made me read things that 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 happened to me more often, like left to my own devices. I'm going to I'm going to keep reading things I know that are going to uh, are going to work for me uh, uh, on all levels. But um, but book two really just, you know, just the people I, you know, the people I listen to like this show, right, what you guys have said on this show and all the channels I watch, I hear about so many books and like, I, some, you know, I, I, I pick them up and read them I'm like, Oh, well, that was really, you know, that was really amazing what happened in this book. I don't know that I liked it, but I really appreciate it. So um, if I was to pick a specific book, that would be hard. I don't know. I know there's well, one, well one of the books I mentioned, uh, Wolf Hall uh, by Hillary Mantel. I'm reading that this year. Also, yeah, that that might have been the book where I went. I can you know I can appreciate everything this book does, and still I don't like it. Um, is it because of the era, or is it because of the writing? Oh, the writing's great. She's a great writer. I've heard that. Um, yeah, and uh, no, I I Hannah. I don't know if Hannah's still here. Hannah from Hannah's Books asked me why, and I said, you know, I'm not really sure. I had. I had, uh, I think I read it right around the time that I had been reading about the Tudors anyway. And so I had a lot of history in my head. Um, and then uh, there were just some things that were done with some of the historical figures that I just didn't like. And I was thinking, I, I'm actually probably going to make a video about this, about what I don't like in historical fiction. And it kind of came from that video and having to, and explaining to Hannah uh, why. I don't like historical fiction that deals with too many real people about whom we know a lot of actual facts. Hmm. So yeah. in that case, you know, we know a lot about those people. So writing it into fiction, I felt like blurred the lines between history and fiction, perhaps in a way I didn't care for. And then I, I, hmm. I feel like I think writers of historical fiction have to be careful. Uh, and I'm not saying that Mantel wasn't, but happy really are treading on on dangerous territory for me as somebody who my field was history uh mm. when they start making real people do things that they we don't know that they did that become part of the plot and the the knowledge that people have about that event like in if you watch my channel uh the i did a, a a takedown video on gone with the wind and my problem with gone with the wind is that it shaped so many people's view of the south and slavery for decades uh yeah. and its representation of reality is well it doesn't represent reality uh and i think a lot of, i think it just has done a lot of damage uh um in terms of um how white people in the side and outside the south view uh, slavery, the Civil War, uh, what that was about. Uh, she's a great proponent of the myth of the lost cause. And, you know, the war was about states' rights, not slavery, all of which is just absolute BS. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, so I, that 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 kind of thing uh, is probably where I draw the line. And I was thinking, uh, to give away my video idea, I read Hamnet uh, by Maggie O'Farrell, which is about uh, kind of, um, around Shakespeare's family. Well, for me, that was fine. We know so little about Shakespeare, the actual person, that making up all this stuff, that's fine. It doesn't bother me at all. I, I read it as a novel with a historical setting, and I think Wolf Hall bothered me a little bit. Because you not have the context. Anything, I'm sorry. Because you have context. Yeah, not that I spot anything wrong, but just like it just felt a little, I don't know, creepy. Made it too much. <laughs> for me, the great thing is that I am very uneducated, so I don't know anything. So for me, I'll go into it and be like, I didn't know these people were people. This is insane. yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it, 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 it is such a good, you know, I, what I would hope is that if you read it and you're interested in that, you would then read a work of history about yeah. it as well, because I think that it's great for leading you to that. I think it just went, did it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I, uh, 
I think that's the power of historical fiction is, is yeah. to kind of lead you into learning. Yeah. Um, I read my favorite historical fiction series are the uh, Aubrey Matron novels by Patrick O'Brien. The first one of which is Master and Commander. Uh, those are great books. And I read them. I thought I'm going to read about, you know, 18th and 19th century sailing warships because these books really made me interested in that. And I read some books about it and it worked because I went, you know, I think I went from fiction to history and it worked because then I could say, oh, OK, well, this is not, you know, that was fiction. This is history. But if it goes the other way for me, I'm, I'm not sure it works as well. That's just a for me thing. Not a yeah. I'm, that's not, I'm not attacking the genre so much as just talking about how, how I react to it. So. Yeah, I mean, you're pretty uh, leveled with your opinions, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're like me, you're like, hey, you know, this is me and this is what I think, but it's cool if you don't. Yeah. And uh, I yeah, always except appreciate Gone with the Wind, you know, except for Gone for the Wind. <laughs> screw that. No, I've, I've never read it. Um, <laughs> no, screw that book. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is uh, somebody said that man tells a place for greater safety is a massive achievement. I never could imagine you could make uh, Danton and Rob Spear. Rob Spear. So Rob boring. Spear. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> that is brutal, Johnny. Come lately, <laughs> and and as you're talking, and I've actually thought this twice now in this episode, but I I'm, I try not to overburden people with recommendations. Okay, I try not to do it. I promise. But sure, even the chat is saying it now. Uh, Evie <laughs> says, "Sounds like Brian could kill two do birds or dogs no! with one stone by reading historical fantasy." Then, and Key is also uh, talking about like historical fiction with main characters, um, and then someone mentions Guy Gabriel K. So do you know anything about Guy Gavriel K? I've I heard the you? name and I've heard many people recommend his book. So I was going to ask you specifically where my, my, when I asked the question about recommendation, where to start, I was going to ask you about Guy Gavriel K. So there are uh, two videos that you could check out that are better okay. than anything I could ever tell you. One's okay. by the library ladder and it's about Guy Gavriel K. He has a couple videos, but he, his argument is that Guy Gavriel K is the greatest living fantasy author wow. right now. And uh -huh. then Jake Bishop is another booktuber who actually has an entire video like, where should you begin? And he's read like, right. Guy Gabriel K. Okay, but great. I'm, I'm going to pitch to you why I think Guy Gabriel K would work for you. So Guy Gabriel K, one, uh, helped work on the Cimmerillion. He oh. was like, Tolkien trusted him. So that's already like, that's yeah. crazy, right? Yeah. Um, and Guy Gabriel K writes what is considered historical fantasy. Very low, except for a few of his books, uh, low fantasy elements. But he will be inspired by a place in time and history, and then he will craft a completely secondary world that's inspired by those things mm -hmm. and kind of make parallels between them. And the cool thing about Guy Gabriel K is he is studious. He will study on the period. He goes and lives in the area mm -hmm. wow. for a time while he writes the book to really understand. And he okay. blends culture, um, music, writing, um, even even sex actually and tries to uh, explore all of the things of that time period it in the story that okay. way so i highly recommend it i just well, read sailing to serantium which mm -hmm. is uh, essentially oh, talking about that yeah yeah sailing to serantium was really good and there's a second book called lord of embers it's a duology and uh yeah. it's all byzantine inspired and okay. it is i mean it is really something uh he has a ton of stuff with a uh, feudal spain um you 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 can kind of browse around and see which book sounds okay. most interesting to you, but I have a feeling you would really like it because you'll still get the history pieces. Yeah, but you don't have to worry about uh you know King Henry showing up or something like yeah. that. It's never yeah. gonna happen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, I I that that does sound more like you know you know with with O'Brien he imagined this you know ship's captain and a ship surgeon and he put him on an imaginary ship and he had him take part in real but fictionalized kind of events. battles and events so that there's a historical framework, but it's not, you know, tied specifically to um, historical people. A yeah. few of them show up, but not very often. So that does sound kind of similar. Uh, yeah, I, I think you'll really like his writing's beautiful, by the way. OK, I mean, great. He's, he's really incredible. Actually, the funny thing is, is the book that a lot of fantasy readers like from him is Tagana, which is like a bit higher in fantasy. Mm -hmm. It's actually my least favorite from him so far. I've actually really liked the really low fantasy things. And one of the things about the fantasy in the world is like superstitions of that time period are fact. Oh, gotcha. So yeah. that is really neat, you know, to, okay. to see that actually with someone be not just believing it, but it worked. Yeah. But, yeah. Like, that that's some cool stuff. So I think I get okay. 
you know, he gets a lot of praise for his literary merit as right. people like to use. I don't really even know what that means anymore. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I subscribed to all that, but all I think that means is uh, actually pays attention to the craft of writing. Yes. That's what I think that means. Yes. I, I think uh, for him specifically, he does. He pays great attention to detail. Uh, and obviously if Tolkien trusted him. Sure. Yeah. You know, high uh, praise. It's yeah. Funny. Very, very high praise. Um, so I, uh, I kind of wanted to ask you uh, another weird question, <laughs> but I was watching, uh, you know, back through your videos and you said, yeah, you started booktube, uh, but you actually had another YouTube channel. <laughs> Will you tell us what your other YouTube channel is or do you not want to sure. tell Sure. No, no, I'll tell you. It was uh, a fishing channel uh, where I made bass fishing videos, um, which, <laughs> which I really loved to do for about five years. Uh, and then um, making bass fishing videos killed my love for fishing. I hardly ever go anymore. It oh, just got no. to be such a grind. Because, um, you know, the great thing about BookTube is that I read a book. I have my ideas. I might make notes, but I sit down at my desk and I, I push play on the cam I push record on the camera and I just talk and I turn it off and I edit it out. If I say something incredibly stupid, I edit it out or I put a little, Hey, I said this and I meant that kind of thing. Yeah. In there. And then I just upload it. You know what I mean? Uh, with a bass fishing video, it's like, you, you don't always catch fish. You might go out and say, okay, well, I need, a, I need a video for this Wednesday. I post videos, let's say Wednesday and Saturday. Need videos this Wednesday. I'm gonna go out and fish on Tuesday. Well, you might go out and fish on Tuesday. I don't catch anything. Well, nobody wants to see a video where you don't catch anything. So you don't have a video. And you've been outside recording for two and a half hours. You know, and that's like, and I did the minimum. I mean, I don't have a boat. I just walked and went to ponds and like showed up and fished in creeks and off boat piers and stuff like anyway. So and so it was just and then you got all this footage, hours of footage where you're doing nothing. <laughs> you know, I'm casting and reeling in and I'm changing out lures. And I'm doing all kinds of stuff. And I'll catch, and then you got like five minutes of video. So you got to take two and a half hours of stuff, find the interesting five minutes and, and put it in there. And then this is way more. Every, people ask me about this. They get way more about bass tube than they ever wanted. <laughs> anyway, anyway, and then you post your video and, you know, the space is dominated by about five huge channels. There are like five huge fishing channels uh, that probably have, they have more than a million subscribers each and they completely dominate everything. And those are the people I watch too. You know, when I, those are the channels, cause they're, they're good and they have production quality and, you know, they had boats and they had spawn, you know, so it was great stuff, but it just was a grind. And then if I went fishing without the camera, just for fun, I go, Oh, I'd catch a fish. Go, oh, I really should have had mm. that. You know, I was using this lure. I never use, and I was a good fish. And, you know, so <laughs> anyway, it just kind of killed it for me. My wife and I went fishing the other day. It was probably the first time I've been in a year. Uh, wow. it just kinda, and I was really worried that booktube would do that for reading, but I've been a reader a I lot. Of ask you that. Bass fishing, so, yeah. yeah. I was about to ask if, if you were had any trepidation about that, but it sounds like it's, it's working out because it's a way <laughs> lower effort, which is, it good. is, it was just, and you know, it's it, here in where I live, it, it's like a, you know, a hundred degrees, 30 days in a row. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, that's a, that's a problem. Uh, so my favorite lure, uh, she was only Evie, uh, is essentially what I do is I take a simple jig and I make what I call what is called a swim jig. I usually put uh, a, uh, a plastic paddle tail plastic fluke. Uh, I bite the head off. I thread it down the hook so that the skirt from the uh, jig hangs over it. Uh, and then I can uh, fish it all kinds of different ways. It has the hook on top so it doesn't catch on uh undergrowth underwater and uh it's real effective in the places i fish um so just nice. the simplest jig you can find not like a flipping jig or but like a simple jig and then a paddle tail fluke of a similar color bass tube killed me man <laughs> that is the funniest thing i've heard this oh, year yeah. oh, was your was your fishing channel bigger than your book channel oh uh no uh okay. my my fishing channel well, I, I mean, it took me three years to get to about 750 subscribers. Wow. And that was like, so also you keep asking questions and get these answers <laughs> over in the fish tube, bass tube world. There's a lot more sub for sub. You know, like 
I sub to you. So you, I, you know, you sub to me, you expect me to sub back. And that's just a terrible way to, but that's all that, because those cha- those big channels just dominate everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was the only way you could build your channel a lot, which meant you had to watch a lot of bass fishing videos. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, most people, instead of watching the bass videos are probably out there trying to catch bass, right? Like yes. that's, that's yes. where they're at. Yeah. Um, but I was, I was teaching at the time and, uh, so my students knew that I had a channel and so they would watch my fishing channel. Uh, and, uh, I had stickers made my channels called, it's still there. It was called the old basser. That was the name of my, uh, fishing channel. And, uh, uh, and so I made stickers, my kids, I said, oh, if you sub my channel, I'll give you a sticker. And so they'd sub to my channel and then I made, uh, t-shirts. <laughs> Everyone's so I can see one in one of my booktube videos, a little old basser t-shirt, with a little fish over here. Um, awesome. the side. So. <laughs> I was convinced that's what I was going to do with my retirement, that I would just do this fishing channel thing. And by the time I got there, I was like, no, that's <laughs> this is more work than my job. <laughs> yeah, I really rather do books. Uh... <laughs> well, speaking of books, I, I, I'm not going to keep it too, too much longer, but okay. I, I have a question um, because you mentioned a lot of prizes or awards, right? Mm-hmm. And there seems to be a very cynical view of book awards now. Every time someone mentions it, you know, you're not going to not get a comment or someone to mention that they're worthless or mm-hmm. they're corrupt, whatever it might be. You and, and I'm not sure how you feel about all awards um, and you can talk about any ones that you want. But would you say that you're cynical towards book re- uh, awards or not? I get the feeling you're not. Uh, for the most part, I'm not. But I think that comes from a point of view of just accepting the basic premise that there that is an, it is somewhat ridiculous to decide which book is the best book uh, in a published in a given year under whatever category, because at that point, you know, kind of like we were talking about with the books I appreciate versus books I like mm-hmm. at that point, you get a big disparity. So what I would hope was that if like the women's prize, that's the one I've been paying the most attention to this year. Uh, what I hope is the judges pick the book that is both that they mm-hmm. liked and that they appreciated what was happening in the book or how, what the author was doing. That's what I hope. But, you know, there are only four or five judges in each one of these prizes. So the idea that they're going to pick the the book uh, and award that, you know, with a prize, you have to accept that it's not going to be that you're not going to think it's the right choice. Ninety five percent of the time. Yeah. Uh, And so I think once you do that, you can just kind of enjoy it. And one of the things that I'm enjoying this year is it's getting me to read things I wouldn't have read. Uh, you know, hmm. things that would have, I never would have heard of. And that's one of, one of the things I like most about it. Like I said, my favorite prize is the Republic of Consciousness prize, which started off in, um, uh, is a British prize, uh, or UK prize, I should say. And now there's a North American one because they, they, were, they, the award goes to a smaller press, uh, mm-hmm. like literally have five, I think that they have to have five or fewer employees working for that press. Uh, and it's a small award, but usually you get a lot of really quirky books uh, out of that list. And that's kind of one of those things that I really like to get a lot of diverse, quirky, weird mm-hmm. uh, books from small publishers. That's just kind of like one of those things I liked. Yeah, so. I, I I've been reading the Booker a mm-hmm. lot lately, like just yeah. and, and it wasn't even on purpose. It just kind of kept happening. And then I was like, OK, well, let's see. Like I read a sci fi that was actually long listed for the Booker. It was a first contact sci fi. And I was like, mm-hmm. that seems strange to be nominated for a Booker. Yeah. Why would I should read this? And I read it. I really liked it. And uh, yeah, In Ascension yeah. by Martin yeah. McInnes. Yeah. yeah. And, and it is definitely a book that I think there's a small amount of people that are probably going to really love it. And mm-hmm. I just happen to be one of those people. Yeah. Um, but it, it's kind of led me to some, you know, new favorites. And the Pulitzer is also one of these as well. I read uh, The Killer Angels by Mar- Michael Shara. I thought it was mm-hmm. fantastic. Yeah. Um, but I was kind of excited about it. Then, you know, you start looking up Booker stuff on YouTube and there's people just every year the Booker gets announced, just what everything that's wrong wow. with the Booker and how oh. awful it is. A lot of people were upset that uh, King Solver was like, half a finalist or half a winner they split the award or something. yeah they split it between with uh uh hernan diaz i believe uh mm-hmm. his book was i believe that's who she split it with yeah i i just I, I think what you i think if you're reading it because if you're reading it and rooting for a specific book to win you're probably going to be disappointed if you're yeah. doing what you do and looking at the list and then looking through the books and lists and saying well this one sounds interesting to me or mm-hmm. this one is like some adjacent to or something I already kind of read, 
then that's the way to do it, to, to look at it as for, you know, suggestions. And so, you know, what I think that's a great re that's a great reason to use your library. So you're not buying these hmm. hardback books uh, that you have no idea if you're going to like or not, you know, get one or two, get the ones you can get from the library. That's, that's kind of where I started with uh, the women's prize. I got the ones I could get from the library hmm. uh, and those are the ones I read. And that was fine. I like I liked them. And then, you know, there were some I, there's some booktubers whose opinion I always trust uh, who said that that one's good. And I said, OK, I'll go ahead and buy those. Mm -hmm. Or the topic was something I knew that that I would like or was something I was interested in at the moment. Uh, so I think maybe a lot of reason a lot of the books on the Women's Prize this year have to do with uh, uh, raising kids and like uh, women who've just given birth and well, like I said, my daughter just had a child. And so I think those books seem more interesting to me uh, this year than they might in, in a different year. Yeah. I mean, all about time and place when you read yeah. something. The power yeah, of that. Oftentimes is, yeah. I, I guess that actually kind of makes sense of why I don't feel as I'm, I'm first off, I'm not very invested in the list, yeah. uh, but I, you're right. I actually just I, that's exactly how I go about it. I look at the list, the long, even things that didn't even make the final cutters, the things, and I just kind of go from there. Yeah. Um, and sometimes the winners are the ones that are very, very interesting. And of course, yeah. I think you start there. You're like, well, what won? Yeah. And then yeah, you go that I used to be list. that used to be a big thing back for before BookTube. I would just see what won the awards that year, and I would go buy those books on yeah. the theory that they must be good. They won an award, not always, but that's yeah. why I found disgrace. That's exactly how. Yeah, uh, I found disgrace because it had the little sticker on there. It won the Booker Award. OK. Yeah. Um, and I'll he read. also won the Nobel Prize in Literature. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that one hasn't led me astray yet because I also uh, read Remains of the Day by Kazuo Ishiguro. Yeah. I Ishiguro is yeah. Oh, what a book. Yeah. Have you read? Um, what's Never the Let one? Me Go? Yeah. Have you read that one? Not yet. I will read it this year, though. <laughs> okay. Everyone tells me it's they're like, don't look anything up. Just read yeah, it. Don't. don't. You need to, that is one of those books where it can be spoiled in a second. Uh, yeah. And anybody who says anything to you other than, you know, you should read it, uh, I think is probably leading you astray. Yeah. Because it can be, it can be easily spoiled. Um, yeah. It's, it's one of the, when I read Remains of the Day, which I thought was the le like less interesting concept of the two books, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this is like, if this was this good, never let me yeah. go. It must be. He can, he can, he can write. He's just, he can really write. He can really create emotions and characters and setting and i i don't always like what he writes but i have yeah. a tremendous amount of respect for 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 his work i i watched some interviews with him and i really just love the way he talked yeah. about writing um and the things that he cares about the characters uh, he was very big on characters actually yeah. that was like one of the things he's like he's like you know i really live inside their heads and um i think it shows yeah so personally I, I think it's great I kind of, I'm kind of hit or miss with author interviews sometimes. Like, I think that that's one of the things that soured me on Cormac McCarthy a little bit was listening to him talk about writing uh, because he doesn't, he doesn't like writers. No, he doesn't like writers and he doesn't like talking about writing. And he talks about his own books as though there's some kind of mystical happening that he has no control over. And that drives me up the freaking wall. A bit <laughs> pretentious, would you say possibly? I, I hate to use that word, but yes, that's what I would say. Would you say you're anti-snob? Uh, I hope I am, but I, I know that I still have snobbish tendencies that I find we all do. Uh, we all do about something in know, our lives, and sometimes it's by accident. Um, you know, yeah. it can happen. Hey. I legitimately believe that every book has value, and you should read everything you want to read. And there is no such thing as a list of books you have to read, other than mm -hmm. books you choose to read. But sometimes people tell me they're reading a book, and I have to like stop myself from going from from saying something negative about that book. And you know, sometimes I fail. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Our good friend Alan from the Library of Alexandria says, I am violently anti snob. And that couldn't actually earlier when you said when something's popular, I just don't want to read it. That's yeah. Alan's MO, actually. Yeah. Um, our, uh, I, 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 I'm talking about the Booker. I don't think I've read the Booker winners. <laughs> like the, since I've been on book two. I read from the list, but I don't think I've read the winners except now Demon Copper Head. Yeah. I uh, will have listened to. And very, very worth your time. Yeah. Uh, Annette says, have either of you read Paranesi? I have, and I yes, loved it. I loved it. I love it. I don't care. Okay, so for a mystery reader, I don't have to figure everything out. So I don't have to understand everything about how that world was created. But just creating a place, an atmosphere, a feeling, investing you in a character, drawing you into a world, that book was brilliant, I thought. Just 
just intoxicating. Really yeah. yeah. I mean, felt yeah. like you were kind of floating away and yeah. what, what I was really in, I mean, whatever it was, I was in by like, I don't know, page 15. So. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree with you, Murphy. I think Paranesi is a really special book. You know, yes. I had a couple of people who loved it. And then by the time like the actual answers started coming around, they're like, no, 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 I don't want any of the answers. Yeah, I kind of felt that way, too. I was like, no, no, it's perfect. Don't don't don't. I don't want reality now. I want I, my reality is the house with the waves and the weird statues. <laughs> yes. you know? I, yes. I, I, and I, I kind of wonder if uh, if we're not supposed to think that he would have been better off possibly i yeah. i actually took the whole thing as kind of a parallel to a cult mentality and uh i had a lot of people disagree with me but they were yeah, like I, they, they were like that's a really interesting take and yeah. i was like i'm very interested in cults and in fundamental religions and things mm -hmm. um and there was a lot about that book that reminded me of the things that i had read um about the behaviors of like control groups and such yeah. like higher control groups and it's like huh i wonder if that was part of it i don't think it was i don't think it was <laughs> But I know what you mean, but I don't, I don't think I think that so much. Yeah, is. nobody else does. It's just me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm alone on my island with my flag. It's just like, it's a call. Uh, <laughs> Evie says, all right, Brian, I'm subbing now. Love that outlook. I begrudgingly accept you not like Withering Heights because you appreciate it. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm sorry that I, I don't like it. <laughs> 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 you know, we're talking about uh, the Booker. We're talking about books that sometimes people can appreciate but not enjoy. And no one has been listed for the Booker more and not won it than David Mitchell. David Mitchell is always just he's he's always the the side chick. He can never just seem to get the ring. Uh, yeah. And Cloud Atlas is one that I know that you mentioned uh, talking about like hard books that you don't have to read, but if you do, you know, go for it. And yeah. Cloud Atlas think, is pretty challenging. Do you think that Mitchell hasn't won because people associate him with uh, genre fiction? Yeah, I think that snobbery still exists. In a hundred, I really do. Exists. I think that um, Never Let Me Go. I think won. Didn't it win the Booker? Can't remember. Uh, maybe. Thank you. Yeah, every every stone out did. Um, I can't remember, but Ishiguro writes in that place and. And uh, that's kind of in that borderland between the yeah. two. And I, I, I think Mitchell was punished for being there, uh, Completely. for kind of being a genre writer, uh, even though I don't think that's fair at all. And I, I, I hate that term. I hate the term literary fiction uh, because it just reeks of snobbishness. And so I wish there were better words to use, but I can't think of them. I'm not that smart. I like you so much, Brian. <laughs> I love hearing that. Uh, I just, I, I always enjoy hearing that from yeah. people who don't even read primarily fantasy. Yeah, I, mean, I read literary fiction mostly is what I read, but uh, it's just a terrible, terrible. And term. I'll put David Mitchell against anybody. Uh, yeah, yeah, I thought, um, what is it? The Thousand Autumns of Jacob. Dezim? I haven't read that one yet, but I heard it's phenomenal. Okay. I thought that was the best. There's always, okay, so I, 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 don't want to like hurt your feelings. There's always a moment in the few Mitchell novels I've read where I'm like, okay, that was, that's <laughs> not, that's not good. That, <laughs> you know, you're going great. And then you just did something. And with the exception of, I read Utopia Avenue, which I disliked. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't read the bone clocks and I, but I will, that I understand that's kind of foundational in some way to the, it, or essential it maybe to the world. has a lot of ties yeah. to other things. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, Utopia Avenue, I thought, was just <laughs> a miss. <laughs> yeah, I really did. Uh, I haven't read it yet. I've only read Bone Clock, Slade House, and Cloud Atlas. And I okay. think Cloud Atlas is literally one of my favorite books. It, it's time. pretty amazing what he, how it works. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and he's able to create, I think, those, some of the worlds he creates are really vivid and work really well. And in snapshots. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I don't think it's true for all of them necessarily, but some of them I thought like the what is it, the retirement home or is it a Timothy a Cavendish? That's awesome. It's uh, so good. The when, when the composer apprentice guy is living at the house with a compo that worked. Um, and then the the world where with the uh, Solutions Crossing. No, no, I, I don't remember the title, but the one where the woman is essentially a clone of some kind, I guess. And she yeah. like that. It's I thought that was something. really well done. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, there's some parts I thought were just great. And, you know, I actually got the humor. In the he is funny. 
that is Dude, that Cavend- was, Cavendish had me like dying. Yes, laughing that was absolutely time. funny. So yeah, yeah. So he, I thought uh, lots of it worked. Yeah, well, Cloud Atlas does have like that's why it's even more impressive to me is because yeah. it shouldn't work. Like the whole book should not work for most mm-hmm. people because he's drawing from different types of ways of telling stories, like different devices. Yeah. He is drawing from different inspirations and time periods of literature, Genre. and he's just yeah, and he's just yeah in in, in novella length building out even a sci-fi world that i would love to see a whole series in. like i'd be like yeah. that that whole cloning world i'd be like let's see this like yeah I, that, I thought that was just so i don't know that really stuck with me more so than like the part uh, on the Sweet. ship you know I just, oh that one's hard adam yeah, yeah more than that hard. more than like the the future one you know with the uh, yeah that but that that one that one really i thought worked Thank you. Yes, that's what it's called, Jerry. Yeah, the Orison uh, of Somni 451. Yeah, a bit of a mouthful. Just, just great. <laughs> it is a lot to remember, yeah. But the the Thousand Islands of Jacob to Zoo, I thought was really good. Yeah. I uh I I I saw that you said you had Red Cloud Atlas and you enjoyed it. It made me very happy to see some Mitchell love because he doesn't he doesn't really get much play from the fantasy fans nor the the yeah literary fiction people. I think I just feel like he he hit that that cloud Atlas moment happened. And and then the recognition awards didn't come. Um, um, Yeah. yeah. Um, It's crazy how that can change people's careers. Yeah. 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 I wonder if it's, I wonder if it's the movie tie in cover that on the paperback when it came out, it it killed it. (laughs) Let's blame Tom Hanks. (laughs) Yeah. I I don't know. I have not read captain blood Murphy, uh, but I want to read that and the uh, Horatio Hornblower uh, novels too. So, so, I, so what's Captain Blood? Uh, I believe it's a seafaring novel. Oh, of Some course, kind of. Murphy likes seafaring. <laughs> of course. And uh, the Horatio Hornblower novels are the, are the same. They're set kind of the same time period as the Aubrey Matron, uh, Master and Commander uh, novels are. But I believe the author of that is C.S. Uh, Forster. This, yeah, this might be for you. It's, yeah, it says historical fiction and the author Sabatini uh, was a proponent of basing historical fiction as closely as possible on the historical facts. All right. So even though it's a fictional character, much of the historical background of the novel is loosely based on fact. Okay. Um, and it sounds like there's some rebels and sea stuff in there. Um, yeah. I like that stuff. I mean, and that and that's kind of like where I'm going with this, when I'm working on this idea of the video about historical fiction, what I do and, and don't like. Uh, which is, you know, I, I'm never going to be completely consistent. There's always going to be something I don't, uh, that I say I don't like and then do, but. Yeah, <laughs> it happens. Yeah. Uh, Jared said, I agree with all your comments about the parts you liked and disagree with all the comments, uh, parts you dislike. Speaking of Cloud Atlas, he's another defender of uh, Cloud yeah. Atlas, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just, I, I admire the, the, I, to say I admire the effort under undersells it. I, yeah. I admire the the ambition of that novel. Uh, uh, it just didn't all work for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, some parts, like I said, work great. Uh, just didn't all work for me as well. But uh, yeah, yeah, I was I was really in uh, when I was reading it, you know. Uh, and it was uh, after the fact where I thought, okay, well, th- this is why am I remembering these parts more than the others? Why is this what resonates? Like, well, maybe it's because I didn't think these parts worked as well. Yeah. I, I uh, definitely would love to see what you think about Bone Clocks because I think it's yeah. Really I'll have good. to get there's another one I have to read. I'm just gonna have a, a whole uh, <laughs> sci-fi fantasy reading month sometime. You can call it the Jimmy Stack if you want. There we definitely. go. We'll call it the the Jimmy Stack. Maybe I'll do <laughs> Jimmy Stack June. Maybe that's what I'll do. Hey, I love Jimmy me Stack July. Oh, I like that better. I do too. It has a good Jimmy ring Stack to it. July. And we'll do All a right. live stream and we'll go over what you thought, and then you'll just pan everything. You'll be like, this is just <laughs> drivel. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, almost, I almost never feel that way about a book i, have I was gonna say i feel like there's anyone that's gonna be nice about it probably be you <laughs> yeah i i have a i don't know i have a probably unhealthy admir- admiration for writers mm-hmm. uh in in a sense because you're kind of just putting something out there and i mm-hmm. i don't feel like i can i i should just you know poop all over it even if i don't like it there's there's got to be something in there that I can usually recognize something about a book yeah. that I find admirable, but even the effort in itself in creating something, you know, yeah. hopefully original, uh, yeah. is, is in my opinion, you know, 
it's something that we should applaud. Uh, yeah. And then obviously have critiques and stuff. I mean, I've heard you a couple of times tonight say, you know, like Old Man in the Sea is complete, you know, dog water. And it's like, yeah, that's fine. That makes sense. Boring. Right? Some great writing sometimes, but boring. Somebody had said they really liked Old Man in the Sea. I'm sorry for, for trashing that in particular. <laughs> uh, time travel reads says i think i might be a snob but it's based on worry i think that right now history is really important to understanding our political situation i wish more book tabers would read history yeah um so i i actually totally love the idea of having all the historical knowledge possible uh you know with any books that we read or whatever we talk about the only thing i will say is i give a lot of grace because it is very hard to know everything and it is especially if you read widely it could be really difficult to know the backstory to everything um of that you read but i do think it's something to aspire to i don't think that makes you a snob at all no, travel I, reads. I, I don't either i i i was thinking about this uh i'm reading um the hundred years war on palestine by khalidi is the author's last name which essentially, from the Palestinian point of view, tells the history of uh, the creation of Israel, its impact on the Palestinian people uh, up through about 2017. And I think it's really good, uh, really uh, eye opening. Uh, but it, one problem with reading about events that are that political right now is that you you kind of have to recognize the bias that exists uh, in any work of history uh, and accept it except that it can still teach you something. It can still contain uh, truths, uh, even if um, you recognize the author's bias. Mm -hmm. That, that, that uh, People oftentimes, oh, they'll dismiss a work of history. Oh, it's biased. Every work of history you've ever read is biased. Every single one. There's yeah. no such thing as unbiased. And if you've ever read one, you read like one of those reading passages on like a state assessment test. That's yeah. as close as you get to unbiased. And still, that's biased. Uh, so it's just it's impossible. You have to recognize it, uh, identify it and still then see, you know, knowing what, you know, read and, and see uh, what it has to say, what it's teaching you, what you can learn from it. It's been yeah. a really eye opening experience. Wow. Yeah, I, I'm it's definitely something to aspire to. Um, Time Traveler says, of course, I don't expect myself or anyone else to be an expert. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, and I, I think I think what I'm saying is I agree with you. <laughs> I think I, I, I agree. And I don't think it makes anybody a snob um, to, to hope that people, you know, learn. But also, it, it's really nice because in a community like uh, BookTube, for instance, you know, there's a lot of people who uh, read a lot of different things yeah. and we give the opportunity to pass on that knowledge and, and to share it uh, lovingly and embrace them with it, uh, which I think is also really excellent. And it's something that uh, always motivates me to like reach out to people who might not necessarily uh, be in my little like niche of booktube. That's why I reached out to you and you were like, yeah. Hey man, like I don't read a ton of fantasy. <laughs> like, dude, don't I, even was, I was worried we wouldn't have anything to talk about now. Uh, Almost two hours now. So no, nah, I I'm always curious. Yeah. <laughs> I can fill, well, I can fill two hours always. <laughs> well, the thing I, I was looking forward to was exactly what's happened is I have some uh, suggestions about where to start with guy Gabriel K. That was one of the things I came into this, uh, wanted to find out about encouragement to read, <clears throat> uh, George R. R. Martin, uh, and go ahead and, and, and do that. And then, uh, the bone clocks that was unexpected. And the second in the Marlon James, see, I do have a whole Jimmy stack. Look. See, I'm telling you. And, and, and yeah. I don't think, I think at least one of them you'll love at least one. I hope. <laughs> I hope. I'm guessing it's a song. Is it? Is that what a song of ice and fire is that? A song of ice and fire. I think Game of Thrones. Is that, I think, the, is that the overall title? That's, or is that's the, the title? whole title. Is a okay, song so of ice and fire. Okay, sorry. See, I never had. That's how little I know. I didn't know if that was one, if that was the overarching title, or if that was the first. The TV show mucked up a lot of the naming, but yeah, it's yeah. a song of ice and fire. Book one is Game of Thrones, which is a phenomenal name. By All way. right. What a okay. great name. Um, uh, that is that. I mean, that, I have access to that. Like right now I could go pick it up because I know see? it's on my son's shelf. Yes. And then so. you'll make me very happy as and long as you like it. If you don't I'm, like I'm, it, just don't tell me. I'm seriously <laughs> thinking that Jimmy, Jimmy stack July is, is going to happen. If, really, if you don't like it, I will I gaslight you into liking it. I will, <laughs> I will call you and I will gaslight you until you enjoy it. <laughs> um, Brian, uh, thank you so much for giving me two hours on a Friday. I know you got a lot of stuff, you know, you're a grandpa now. I know, I know you got a lot of responsibilities, a lot of things that you like to do. So for you to give uh, two hours to me and to the people here, uh, I know I appreciate it. I know they appreciate it. So thank oh, you so well, much, dude. I really appreciate you having me on. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah. We'll definitely do it again. Yeah. Um, I, I, I can think about a million things we could really dive in on, especially Cormac McCarthy. It's not a all the time. I might meet someone that's read everything. Um, 
you know. Uh, yeah, I had, back. well, I haven't read everything, but enough. <laughs> You're, yeah, you've read a lot. You've read the big ones. So, um, if, yeah, if you just want to make people mad, I, we could talk about I have a whole show about Corbin McCarthy, and I would definitely make people mad. As long as no one posts it to the subreddit, we'll be all right. <laughs> that, that's where you get in the that's dicey, dicey scenarios. Um, Lee, if you could leave us with uh, one thing, and this is the thing I admire most about you, um, is that there are times where I stumble across creators that are a little bit older and have read a lot of stuff, and they seem just kind of cynical about reading and about publishing and about books. And you were not that guy. Uh, you you were very encouraging. Uh, you were very um, you know, I think you're very open minded uh, and you just have I can see the joy of reading still in you. So how do you stay away from falling into those cynical traps about publishing and books and all this stuff? I think uh, mainly I make videos and uh, people hold me accountable and people suggest things to me. Hmm. And uh, I, I say all the time, you know, I love BookTube. I love the BookTube community. The same thing everybody else says. But for me, it just really has made me so much a better reader and reinvigorated my love of reading and made me a really curious reader. I want to read all those books because, you know, if I just kept reading the same thing over and over again, like I've read all of Hemingway twice and a lot of Faulkner twice and all of it, you know, I've read that because I thought, oh, there's nothing else to read. Everything else is crap. And then, you know, I got on, on BookTube. It was like people were like, hey, I was like, well, I haven't read that. And I go, well, you should read that. It's really good. Well, okay, I'll read it. Oh, wow, that was really good. And so now I'm just... If you, I just feel like if you limit yourself, and this is why I want to do the Jimmy Stack July. If you limit yourself to uh, one genre or one area, you are missing things. Uh, and uh, I guess I just don't want to. I, do, I guess I just don't want to miss something, an opportunity to read something great, to have those experiences we're talking about, where you're just like, mm -hmm. like with Paranassi, we're talking, about, just so into the book that you, yeah. you you lose yourself and the world feels real and. Um, it's just that is I never would have read Piranesi before I was on book. Not never would I pick that book up uh, and so glad that I did. You know, such a such a really good book uh, that I really enjoyed a lot. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I don't I don't I don't know. I just have a desire not to be. Not to not know, I guess. And that sounds not salty. That's all I like it. Just, I have a desire to to like just read as much stuff as I can is a better way of putting it probably. But. Uh, as long as they're not too long, because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's beautifully said. Uh, not not uh, abiding by your own boundaries you set for yourself and pushing it and continuing to find that magic is key. Yeah. Um, and certainly uh, something that helps me out in life. So maybe it can help everyone else out there <laughs> as yeah. well. Keep reading. But read what you want to read. Hell yeah. Don't listen to me. Go find something. <laughs> Let it lead you to the next thing. Yes. That's, that's the best way to do it. Absolutely. I love it. Well, Brian, thank you again so very much. Thank you, Jimmy. Here. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Chat, thank you for being here. Make oh, sure to go show Brian some love. Go subscribe to his channel, Bookish. Oh, thank you very much. He has fantastic videos. Uh, you're going to get some real authentic opinions uh, and delivered always in a very mindful and caring way, which I appreciate. So uh, until we see you next time, we hope you're good. We hope you're safe. Remember to always keep turning the page.